Welcome to the Select Board, Board of Health Sewer Commissioners meeting of August 9th, 2023. It is now six o'clock. This is a uh, meeting will be held in a hybrid fashion with the uh, opportunity for both in-person attendance and remote participation. Please note that while an option for remote attendance and or participation being provided as a courtesy to the public, the meeting or hearing will not be suspended or terminated if technological problems interrupt the virtual broadcast, unless otherwise required by law. Members of the public with particular interest in any specific item on this agenda should make plans for an in-person versus virtual attendance accordingly. The meeting will be held in person in the main meeting room of the Deerfield Municipal Offices in accordance with Mass General Law, Chapter 30A. Anyone intending to tape the meeting must identify themselves to the clerk and provide their name and address for the record. Um, okay. The dial-in number is toll-free is 833-548-0276. Meeting ID is 911-604-1580. And the passcode is 570012. So welcome, everybody. Um, we have public comment. Is there any public comment? Hearing no public comment, we are moving right along to um, our appearances. So John and David, welcome. Thank you so much for coming. Um, we are talking about uh, engagement letter for the Leary Lot electric vehicle charging. Would you like to um, discuss that, David? Or John. Or John? John, you want to jump in first, sure. Good evening, everyone. Uh, nice, to, nice to be with you virtually. And um, David and I are happy to to talk with you about the EV charging project and our proposed engagement. Uh, we did. We have had the opportunity. I guess just in way of introduction, David and I have had the opportunity to um, roll up our sleeves and get started under the letter of intent. And um, we're we're very bullish on the projects at the Leary lot and at Town Hall. It's a real pleasure to work with David, as we've talked about a little bit about in past meetings. David is formerly the head of central services and an operations management role for the city of Northampton before retiring, before nearly retiring, but not fully retiring, uh, retiring into private service um, and, and uh, community work. So we had the opportunity to have David join our team and he'll be our local project manager and the overall project manager for the two Deerfield projects. It's a real pleasure to work with David. David also, in addition to having a, um, a project management operations and finance background, has a construction project management background as well as, emer as emergency management. Uh, David has also implemented a number of EV charging projects successfully in Northampton, which is great experience. And our company is um, very experienced over the past two and a half years in EV charging. We've been in clean energy for 15 years since 2008, and we've developed some of the largest solar and energy resiliency battery storage projects across the state. Um, the EV charging business has been really interesting for us. Currently, we're managing the strategy and implementation for the city of Boston citywide project. And we recently completed projects in Western Massachusetts in La Meadow, Westfield, and um, as well um, nearby, we um, we have a number of other projects happening and focus on EV charging in the eastern part of the state and on Cape Cod as well. So that's that's a quick background. And um, as I said, it's it's a pleasure to be working with David. David, could you give a little bit of background on yourself? Well, I think you pretty much covered it all, John. But um... Um, you know, I have a lot of experience working in local government and uh, uh, worked with numerous communities in Western Mass uh, through my associations in Northampton and uh, um, definitely uh, bring a lot of diverse skills to project development and management, especially concerning EV charging as it relates to the Deerfield project. Um, I just had a couple of questions. 
Um, when are we going to hear from the feds on our level three chargers? Does, do you know? I get I get a little confused with all the different charging options. We um, we are hoping to to hear from the Federal Department of Transportation in the um, either kind of Q3, you know, which is the fall time frame, or early in the fourth quarter of of this year. We don't have a they didn't share a firm date for responses, uh, so. We're somewhat, you know, in a waiting phase right now. I do think that uh, Deerfield is, or we do think that Deerfield is very well positioned for both the Leary Lot public access charging projects, level three and level two through the federal grant, as well as um, green infrastructure upgrades, civil and site work, bicycle, pedestrian, curb cuts, et cetera, um, that we've requested. And um, we're very happy about the the letter of uh, support from Congressman McGovern that um, we worked with closely with Chris Nolan to uh, to draft and the Congressman sent it right in. So that, I believe that letter is in your packet. I'm sure you've already seen it. So short answer is we don't know, but we're thinking, you know, this fall or maybe early winter, uh, and we'll have to see how quickly they can turn it around. And so the other thing um, I wanted to know is when we uh, sign the contract with you, that actually doesn't, does it start when we hear that we have the grant? Start, it would start immediately. And in fact, we've already, you know, started, you know, significant, you know, number of hours of work um, over the, over the past. Uh, the initial grant. Three, four months. Yeah. For the, and also for the, the planning for utility utility application for make ready infrastructure funding through Eversource. Um, so our work would start immediately and our role is uh, to be the town's advisor and owner's representative across the whole project. That's our role is to advocate for the town and to advance your interests and to have, a, have an overall project management role. So we, we basically have already, you know, we're operating in good faith here. So we've already started and this agreement allows us to um, um, are to you, make sure we're under contract. Are you seeing, because um, EV chargers are becoming more mainstream, are you seeing that the, this is considered under normal um, town activities for insurance, or is this going to be uh, another cost for us on top of the EV chargers? Um, in terms of operating costs for insurance? Yeah. It is, first part of your question, I, comfortable answering which is it is becoming a very normal thing for towns to do and towns including towns of your size and cities um so that's becoming very normalized i think i'm not sure i can't answer um specifics about your insurance policy because i'm not an insurance expert and also i don't i'm not familiar with your policy but um we we are seeing uh towns at ev charging pretty um at a pretty quick pace and um, so my, I'd be optimistic about that, but I'd have to refer to your, the well, town council. Most, yeah. most of the communities have MIA, the uh, Massachusetts Interlocal Insurance Agency coverage. So I didn't know if other towns were paying a separate surcharge or um, it was included in their policy as normal activity already. General, and I, I can't be a hundred percent on this, um, but the systems that we installed in Northampton, um, I think were treated under the blanket property insurance policy right. that the city had, not specific assets, um, such as new vehicle purchases, or if we brought a new building online, um, obviously that's gonna change the property insurance uh, coverage, which Northampton also run runs through Maya. Um, but I think things like, you know, streetlight additions, EV charging, uh, you know, redoing your parking lot or expanding your parking lot. I don't ever remember getting anything from the procurement officer saying our coverage levels are now different with the installation of some EV chargers. Okay, thank you. I was just so, curious. So I have some several questions, but I'm not sure if they're directed, best directed to Chris Nolan or you guys. So let me just ask them that. There are a couple sure. of letters, there are a couple of letters in the package tonight, Chris. 
One is dated 6-22-2023, and one is dated 6-23-2023. And the 6-23-2023 the says that the uh, final Eversource rebate amount is 575,006, uh, six, well, basically $575,000. There's the one on 622 is $160,000 more. So is that just an oversight or is that? Cut back? That is a good question. Let me go to that page right now so that I have a good reference. And similar question there, this is um, bids from Universal Electric. And um, there are two of them in here, and uh, one of them is for $35,220, and another one, which appears to be the same exact stuff, is for $33,000, so $2,000 less. I believe in the universal, while Chris looks up the other question, I believe in the universal electric case. Um, is that a call? Go ahead. That's not us, but we did we did review that. Um, we did review that. I believe that that um, Universal added an option to fully commission all of the assets. Work with the manufacturer to do all the phone, the you know the phone calls and the work to and the technical work to get the unit up and running. That's kind of an optional because it could also be done by the town. So I think that. Commissioning from memory was about twenty five hundred dollars or two thousand dollars. Yeah, it's two thousand. I see now, and one of them was dated in August twenty fifth with a valid through, well, actually July twenty fifth, valid through August twenty fifth. So that's the higher one. So that explains that one. Uh, and I just found the answer to your other question. Um, so the six twenty three one is more up to date. I believe the six twenty two one was based on some preliminary numbers and. Um, the 623 letter has the updated number, so that should be the accurate one. I apologize for the com confusion over that. And, and one final question. Um, we already signed a letter of intent. Did we did we actually pay you anything? Uh, or or now are we figuring out what the real cost is? And is the cost when we signed the letter of intent lower or higher than what we're now talking about doing? Um, so we, we operated under the because it was a lot of preliminary work and we are enthusiastic about the project, we basically spec our work. Uh, we didn't charge anything, but we were operating under letter of intent until present, you know, this, until we, um, the kind of the present time or currently. Okay. Um, so for the level two project, our proposal is to have an engagement for 28,500 total for our company. Rivermore Energy, and that would be led by David with support from me and our team. And um, that would take us all the way through the installation of the infrastructure, coordination with Berkshire Design on the um, overall planning for the project, which David has done before with Berkshire Design in Northampton. So that should be helpful. And then the installation of the charging station. So we'll be your representative through this whole process, which we um, would hope would be completed by. Um, the end of 2023 and the infrastructure will be in a level and the level two charging stations will be installed at um, the Leary lot and at town hall. So that's where that work would stop. And if the grant is achieved and there's additional work and the level three charging stations then we can do an addendum to the, um, to our advisory and our owner's representative agreement that you have. So, uh, so I have a huge uh, concern of cost on, on all this stuff. So I'm just trying to get my head around it. There's no, like, I don't know if there's one page that really tells me all of these costs. I see a large grant opportunity, which we don't have yet. And I think a total of like $707,000 to put in these charger stations with, um, I, I don't know where the money's coming from um, and and how much we are subsidizing the cost, uh, the taxpayers are subsidizing the cost to charge people's cars. So I, I, I'm just really concerned about the whole project, the overall cost of it, where we're getting the money to pay for it. Um, I, it they're wonderful grant opportunities, but it still leaves like a couple hundred thousand dollars that the town has to come up with. Um, so I'm really trying to understand where that money's coming from, how you'll recoup it. We are losing our shirt on the chargers that we have already. So 
and not to be a Debbie Downer, but I, like we don't have a ton of money, and this is, just seems like a colossal amount of money for um, chargers. I w I was going to suggest because of our problem here tonight that we table this for um, another meeting only because we are worried about cash flow. But I see Chris has a hand up, so maybe you can explain some of this stuff. Yeah, I, I just want to clarify on some of those concerns. So the amounts of money you see that are in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, those are the costs that would be assumed if we were talking about a level three charger situation. Um, from my understanding, the level two chargers are a lot cheaper to implement. And if we don't get the federal grant, that is all that we would be on the hook for. Um, so the amounts that you see, the, the 500 to $700,000 range, that would largely be in the form of rebates that we would get from this grant. Um, whereas what we're asking for tonight is specifically the 28,500 for uh, Rivermore to be able to continue doing the work that they've done so far, um, because frankly, I couldn't do it without them. Um, there's There are a lot of moving parts to this project and we do wanna hit the ground running on it in a timely fashion to be able to break ground this year, um, which is still very possible, but we, we need to be expeditious about the way that we're going about this. Um, and I think based on the 496,000 and change that the board has allocated to the Leary lot project so far, um, just asking for authorization to be able to use 28,500 of that for this project, I think is, I, th I think it's a reasonable ask. And I, I just want the board to consider granting that tonight. Well, my, my only concern is that we would be spending $28,000 for a project we may not complete. So uh, I don't really have a dollar amount on what a charger, a two stage two charger is going to cost totally to the town. I see, I think I, it's around 707 if we do some phase threes, but I'd really, you know, to, to be honest, I really need to know how much, a, how much this project's going to cost, what the engineering is. I understand they've done some work already, and um, I, I people don't work for free. So if there's a cost for that, we should know what that is. Um, I just, I, it's all fuzzy to me, and I need to know what total costs are, what our total engineering is, um, and what the probability of getting any grant money is. Well, that's a good question, and I think we should um, we should address it very clearly. So we have put together a budget for. Rivermore put together a budget for the town, um, and we it includes both the level. It's only for level two charging and for the uh, infrastructure, as Chris Nolan just said. So the level three project is a prospective project. Mm -hmm. It's not a definite project because you don't have federal funding. It is correct that two level three charging stations would cost about $700,000 for the equipment, they're expensive. So yep. that project is a maybe and it's contingent on um, the grant funding and Got we it. can walk you through the strategy on the match, but basically based on some of the infrastructure funding and the state funding, we think you, yeah, as well as your spending through ARPA funding on the parking lot over at Leary, we think you're gonna, you've, you're comfortably already meeting your match without additional dollars there. But we can get to level three, I think, you know, at it at when we have more time, but basically that project's not happening without a federal grant. You have no obligation to do it. But in terms right. of level level two, we have a very uh, I think clear summary budget for that. Uh, Chris, do you have do you have that handy? Are you able to put that I up? Do. On your screen? So um, it's in the board packet. I apologize that the packet didn't exactly come together as nicely as I wanted it to for this particular section. There was just a lot of paperwork to work through. Um, however, there is a chart. Um, it reads Leary lot colon forecasted project budget provided to town. Um, I got that. I so got that. the one that you see at the bottom, June 2023, specifically dives into the Leary lot. Um, and just to kind of take it line by line, uh, the state EVIP funding is the grant that's been received for that in the amount of 19,130. Um, the Eversource rebate has also been received. Um, the construction costs from Universal Electric are that 35,220 figure you see. Yep. The 18500 would be for Rivermore um, because the majority of their work is going to be done at the Leary lot. Um, so that's the majority of their 285. Mm -hmm. um, so the total project cost in that case would be about 30750 on the town's responsibility. So nowhere near the hundreds of thousands range that we would see for the level three, um, which would be, as John said, kind of a 
propositional project if we get that grant. Okay. So I hope I hope that kind of helps to ease some of the the fear. Yeah, no, that, that. That's very helpful. That's and then number and then the. Can I just pump. ask? Did we did we appropriate that from the ARPA funding? We have, Chris? So no. um, currently, from the ARPA funding, there is four hundred ninety six thousand and change committed to the Leary Lot project. So um, this could very feasibly be applied to that. So we haven't funded it yet, approved okay. it yet, but we, we well, could we use that to do talking it. Talking about that being part of the expense of the Leary Lot mm -hmm. though. Right, and I don't have an exact number from Berkshire Design as to how much work that's going to be, but that is also largely contingent on some of the more nitty gritty design details that we are finally we're we're in the final stages of working through before they put shovels in the ground yep. so um yeah this is just kind of where we are right now if it's only going to be a level two project um yep. which it will there will be ev charging there um for all intents and purposes um but it's just a matter of will it be a combination of level two and three or will it be all level two uh, and if it's all level two then the figures that you see on those sheets are for the most part going to be accurate. So Rivermore, for if it's phase, uh, so if it's phase two, this is our cost for the Leary lot. We put we put several chargers, eight ports in there, four chargers. Do you, um if this somehow switches to a phase three, we get the grant money, how much additional cost are we spending, or is that engineering cover most of that? The, um, the infrastructure will be in the ground already, which is nice from Eversource, and it yep. will already be, it's 100% funded by the utility with no obligation from the town. So Got they'll it. put basically the, all the equipment, which is made transformer, meter, and then underground conduit, conduit and wiring up to a con small concrete pad. So yep. that'll be in the ground, and Eversource is able to rate base that, so they're bullish on doing it, um, and, you know, basically they'll fund it all. Okay. So. You'll have the infrastructure there, and then let's say you receive the federal grant. We don't know how much of your of the requests the town will get. You know, will it be a portion? Will it be all? We don't. Will it be none? We don't know. We know that you have a great application. You meet the criteria really well. You're within a mile of the highway. You're in a town center. You're about ten different ways that you do really well on the grant scoring. So we'll have to see. But you'd have to evaluate it because you may choose to take the grant or you may choose not to, depending on how much money is made. But we think right now that you'll have very little, if any, you may have none in terms of match because you're already spending money on the Leary Lot project. And we think you can get to your 20% match with the combination of that and the state grant and some of the utility infrastructure. So that we need to prove that out by looking at the formula, formula for the grant based on how much you you receive, knock on wood. But that's a TBD and we can't make any commitments until okay. you you and we look at it, but you know, that's what we're going for. So you have no obligation beyond this for the Leary lot. You have zero obligation beyond this, approximately $30,000 for four level two ports, which is two charging stations. And then the um, the second project is at town hall. And then there's a, in the spreadsheet, there's another tab. I'm not sure if we're printed out, but. Yep. 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 Okay. Um, that one is um is about, the funding responsibility on that one is twenty six thousand ninety dollars. So you're talking about um, a total of uh, around, um, you know, fifty seven thousand dollars. So um, where we're getting killed in town is the demand charge to that. No, pole. that's changed, yeah, Trevor. That's Has changed, it changed? Trevor. Yes, and I was going to ask Chris to talk about that. Oh, that's the Eversource bill that came in. Can you talk us through that, Chris? Happily. So, um, yeah, we got some good news regarding demand charges. Um, those have been dropped from our bill. We renegotiated with Eversource to a new rate that has been permitted for a lot of towns had been complaining about the same issue that we were having. Um, so I actually have attached, um, it may not have made it into the packet, but it was one of the documents I sent out today um, via email to all of you was the latest bill that we've gotten from Eversource. Um, and it might not be a perfect representation because we still do have a credit on the account that um, is related to our Schedule Z allocations, but that's a whole nother story yeah. for another day. Um, but okay. the, the main idea is that we will not have demand charges anymore. Um, and even if we do have more EV charging put in, in addition to that one station already, um, those are not going to be killing us the way that they were prior to this month. 
Okay, that's helpful. That's super so, helpful because um, the biggest we're, cost. We're running over time. Um, yeah. So, what would you um, like to do? I mean, you suggested that we table the decision on this until the next meeting. Well, um, I know we're worried about cash flow, and unless we decide to pay through this from ARPA money. How how long does a char charger phase two charge? Just real quickly, like how long does it take? Yeah. For a for it depends on the vehicle and the size sure. of the battery, but in the for a full if you went from zero, right, then we're talking six or eight hours. Okay. And um phase three is well, the ones that we that we uh, requested from the you know, when we wrote the grant application with Chris, we requested um very ultra fast level three charging that would charge a car in 30 minutes or okay. possibly 20 minutes. So, um, you know, well, anyway. To go with the level three. I mean, that's if really the people. money. Yeah. Um, I like the level two has a real value proposition because let's say I, I, let's say I went out to dinner or lunch at Berkshire Brewing Company or one of the five or six restaurants within walking distance if I, in two hours, you can get a really nice charge. Um, and you know, if you're if you're there for a couple hours, I mean you could get a 20, 30 percent charge on your um on your vehicle. Most people don't let it go below 20 percent. So I think there's real value proposition there. And and then also it, you may not be back in 20 minutes or 30 minutes to move your car and people get really annoyed. Yeah. So I, it's nice to have a mix, mix of the stations, you know. Yeah. And what do we have out there now? Is that a two? two. That's a two. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So, I mean, we, we really think this is going to activate your downtown in terms of um, visitors and it's a real amenity. We think from a from an economic development perspective, I mean, we're seeing towns really want to really wanting to get these in the town centers and people when they can get to you within, you know, five minutes of Route 91 approximately and from surrounding towns very easily. And there are a bunch of amenities and the Good Hampshire lumber there as well. We think, we think this is. I mean, that's one of the reasons why David and I are so bullish on the project. We think it's one of the best use cases we've seen for a combination of environmental mm -hmm. and economic development. Great. Um, I feel like this is. I mean, we got to have some support here. So I, I okay. I'm okay paying money out of the ARPA funds for this. Yeah. Um, I'm okay with that. I, I'm glad to hear the demand things figured out because that was my biggest concern that we were just, you know, know. subsidizing well, everyone else yeah. charging their car. Um, and I just would love to learn more about the matrix of how we, how much we charge, that kind of thing, just just to make sure that we're getting well, that's cost why we covered. Need support. Yeah, so, no, I agree. Okay. So I'm what good. do you want to do? I'm You're good. fine with it? Yep. Yeah. If you make a motion. I'll, I'll make a motion that we um, support. Um, the twenty-eight thousand dollar request, whatever it is, is twenty-eight. Twenty-eight five. Twenty-eight five for a Rivermore um, out of our ARPA funding for, for the Leary lot. For the phase two. For okay. phase two. All yeah. right, I'll second that. Thank you. All those in favor? Tim Hill, GI. Trevor McDaniel, I. Carolyn S. I. Thank okay. you for the Thank clarification. You. Thank, Thank you. you for the work, Chris. Thank you, guys. Really appreciate. I, I know this is, it's just helping hard me for, understand it a bit. It, yeah. I was thank just, you all. And uh huge thank you to John and David for both being here tonight to yeah. help with the explanation on this. Cause yeah, it is, it, it's a lot to wrap your head around at times. And um, we all, I think, think it's going to be a terrific project um, and are looking forward to seeing the result. So thank you all again. Thank you. John. Thank you everybody. Have a good night. Thank you. Chad. Thanks for your time. Take care. Um, David. And and Darius, why don't you come up uh, to the table here? And I think we have a couple other. Oh, Annie. Hey, Annie. Annie. I recognize Annie. I don't know if there's any other Energy Committee people here. Uh, but anyway, welcome. welcome. Um, we're really excited. I am uh, was a little confused as to what was going on. But I think I'm grasping that there's two separate tracks that we're trying to do. Uh, there's a solar development, and then there's a green communities kind of stuff. And there is a, a money available under the Inflation Reduction Act for solar development, and not under the green communities, which is just to lower the energy costs. 
So, um, David, I wanted to clarify, there's three different levels of audits. Mm -hmm. This is where my confusion was coming in. We had the vendor's audit that I think Bill Hildreth is doing now right. or had done for both Frontier and DES. Is that correct? I believe so. I, yeah, I okay. And so what we want to do tonight is talk about um, the no cost of the town, the standard municipal program audit, the second level audit, and then the potential for us to do um, the in-depth technical analysis audit that will allow us to do solar on say the roof of both DES and Frontier kind of thing. Am I am I on the track on this? Um, it's not entirely clear to me whether the technical analysis um, would include, you know, like rooftop engineering, and and it, we might need more than that. It probably would, but let me just outline them. The vendor audits are kind of the lowest level mm -hmm. of just looking for you know, ways to seal the building and insulate and stuff. The municipal level audit is done not by the vendors. It's, it's a mass save Eversource promoted okay. audit that is contracted with someone in the business of auditing. Mm -hmm. And Eversource can guide how, what they're looking at. But it's can, no cost. This is a no cost. That's the municipal okay. level audit is a, is no cost. It it costs Eversource thirty five hundred bucks, which they want us to know, but but they cover. Um, that audit, I think, would also constitute the preliminary audit toward yet a. It's kind of a third option. There's there's solar development and um, green communities, but Eversource has its own program called a Deep Energy Retrofit. And it requires two audits. The first says, we think you can get to a 40% savings on energy use at this building. If that audit says, no, I don't think that's going to happen, that's the end of it. If you potentially could, and I believe that's where potentially there might be solar offsetting, um, you know, some of the energy use at the school. Um, that audit is called a technical audit uh, for the deep energy retrofit. And it's very detailed apparently um, with actual dollar numbers on what kind of machinery you might need to replace or add, what controls and so on. So that would be the most detailed audit of the three, but it's aimed at the Eversource program's deep energy retrofit, which is a three-year program. And um, we would have to do some managing to try to get grants to cover what they recommend and stuff like that yes um so just to be clear i think the last time you spoke with us you said this third audit the deep energy audit that there would be a limited commitment like the town would effectively pay three thousand dollars or something yes now is that per building uh it probably is yeah i mean the the three thousand actually comes from 11 right it came from the eversource estimate and it was off the cuff that similar buildings similar audits cost twelve thousand dollars they cover 70 percent which my math is good yeah. is 8.4 so, you know. so we would have our the deerfield side of that would be 35 or something yeah yeah no it'd be it'd be um half of that because the other towns would pick up oh okay right i was talking about just yeah yeah yeah, uh, regional, but in in the case of DES, it, it would be all Deerfield. It would be all Deerfield. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And okay. Oh no, go ahead. I was just going to ask. Um, so, say for DES, what are we trying to achieve? Right, 
energy efficiency and i'm thinking like we did the boilers already we're putting in hvac like mini splits right already so we've mm -hmm. done the lighting in there with it and we did the green communities grant a couple of times so um where do we think we would i mean would these audits would say change all the windows to triple glazed or uh close up windows or add um, more ins i mean we i know we did a ton of insulation on the roof when we did the roof um we put like six inch or eight inch yeah, we did. foam and then and then the top so um i'm just trying to figure where we would well, try to might get some see money. it in in putting the mini splits to more use than they are um like on a program that would that would, sense when's needed when's not kind of thing well that would just be a good thermostat but it's a little and i am not an hvac expert so <clears throat> that's why we need audits is i'm mm -hmm. not that good but i have talked with people who are expert and um especially from umass extended uh, energy extensions and one of the options at des um might be to um there there were several actually uh to put in a heat pump type central system or as with frontier either one could use a central heat pump or since they already have a lot of mini splits integrate those to be served with the central heat the central system provides the air circulation that's needed but so that's um, an issue of adjusting what the central system delivers to a classroom in terms of heated air versus not such heated air mm -hmm. and let the mini split do the heating so there there are things like that like at frontier there are some crazy things like apparently there's a rule that if you have a shower head you have to provide heat hot water for it and my understanding is they're not using a lot of the showers and they're still heating water in a giant tank and actually that tank could be a heat sink to minimize the gas boiler use to so that when it when it's cheaper or not in such demand you can heat the water and use it to heat the air going to classrooms so there are things like that okay. that are out there that are potentially you know worth exploring right now i see the first step is just doing the no cost audits and and finding out what that's at level that two that that's would be the level two the municipal audit not the vendor audit right. but just a, a little step up from that mm -hmm. um and see see Could what we, they would, say would, you, would you be able to get um standard under the standard municipal audit that we're talking about that level two would you be able to get solar information do you think no i don't think so. i mean it's i i shouldn't say that i don't haven't heard that said i i have okay. heard that to do the solar would require a real engineering analysis of the roof and yeah um a couple of things so is there any reason darius why you wouldn't support doing yet another level two audit of the the two buildings you no, very committed an email that we would do it okay so oh thank you darius yeah, yeah. yeah so that we'll move forward with that that, that, that question you know is, is behind us um and if i understood you correctly you said that that the number two level audit eversource is slightly involved in that um there's no no um commitment like they'll do it but we don't have to do what they recommend no no yeah. i i'm not saying that we would do anything they recommended i'm just saying that they would be involved in it somehow yeah. Yeah. and they're also involved in the vendor one well um they have approved contractors okay the, so, the so they it's, hire. it's it's a list of contractors that look like the same contractors like i think bill's working with right one okay. of their approved contractors so mm -hmm. it's it's a 
they can just guide what they're looking for in terms of what would reduce the demand on the utility because right. they're paying 3500 bucks to right to, but i mean we could something. we would obviously want to be involved in what are they looking at yeah if we were going to commit to paying any a portion of the deep energy audit we would be saying these are the things that we're concerned about above and beyond whatever source cares about uh yeah okay, um, okay. Yeah. and uh, solar i have my own opinion that um Oftentimes, when you ask a solar company, can you put solar panels on the roof, they look at the roof deck engineering and say, this roof is designed to support X amount of pounds per square foot. Right. They don't look at the side walls of the building, which if you drop a load on it and it transfers straight down to the ground, it doesn't put any load on the rooftop. Mm -hmm. And even if you had to build a, uh, a structure that ran metal supports up the side of the building and then across the building, you can find a way to do this if you just use your brain a little. Yeah. So uh, the, the idea that we can't put solar on a building because the roof deck doesn't support it is to me something that you have a discussion with an engineer and you say, before you tell us no, tell us about this possibility. Yeah. Um, you know, because if we're going in the heat pump direction and or the uh, mini split direction, they all take energy, they all take electricity. And if we could find a way to get grants to pay for these things, it would lower our energy costs. And as a municipality, we could take the excess energy that doesn't get used in the schools and transfer it to other electric bills that the town has. And as well, you have the option, of, you know, they've got new gas boilers and yay, but you'd have the option of Being using, electric. using them when gas is cheaper and using electricity when it's not. So, so resilience. Darius, do you want to talk a bit about the projects that you're already doing? Because I know that we discussed you're doing a lot of these. Yeah, the, I guess where the, 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 I guess where the issue of where the school, I say the schools, I guess it would be my office mm -hmm. versus um, some green energy initiatives is that it's all based on money and realistic of moving money. And I know people were disappointed that the Frontier went forward and put gas boilers in when other alternatives could have been sought. Um, and from my perspective, realistically, that's what had to be put in yeah, for, the, for the system that currently exists at Frontier. Um, and it could be argued out with people um, whether or not that is it. the same thing is happening with the mini splits. You know, we're seeing these wide ranges of, you know, uh, uh, weather that we've, you know, whatever that affects student learning in the sense that we don't put AC into those classrooms. Ideally, we'd be we would be um, hooking those up to a main computer system where you because right now you technically could turn the heat on and turn the AC on. Yeah, right. Yeah. You, oh, could yeah. have the, you could have right. a wonderful energy fest in some of these <laughs> classrooms. Um, but we're looking at it. You know, right now we've agreed. You know, we put in we got forty five thousand dollars from the community um, from Deerfield this year for Deerfield Elementary to put in mini splits. We're able to roll that money through, we're actually putting 11 mini splits in from the original five, because we're taking, we talk with the town and we're able to take the rebates and then put in to do more. And so we've taken a project that was gonna take five years and probably gonna get it done in three to get the air conditioning in those rooms. And so from an operation standpoint, that's, that's where I'm leading okay. first, because I'm looking at the kids in the classroom yeah. when we have so 87 degree days and it's muggy, and oh, you know, just the general, awful. just you know, and it also, you know, when you do, you were able to remove the moisture from the classroom, that kind of thing. It's also, um, you know, breaks. You know, we don't have much mildew and those yeah. kind of things there. But so the idea of tying it into wonderful idea. Yeah, I don't know. You know, I don't know how we pay. For it, you know what I mean? And there are a lot of other needs on our capital list that's going to be a priority that's going to jump above that in the next few years. But if there's grant money out there that so we can do this audit and then find grant money to attach to it. Great. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. But I also don't want to be I'm also very realistic and pragmatic to what's the issue right in front of us. I just want everybody to understand that there's, you know, if we put you know solar on buildings, great. Is it going to come out of the school budget? I'll fight against you on that. You know, you know, maybe the school committee will disagree, but I'm not going to take away from students to put solar oh, no, on. No, no, oh, no, you no, know, no, no, no. You know, I was kind of saying where, you know, I'm sitting on. Uh, right. Absolutely. Absolutely. What I'm saying is I would, I know Frontier is a four town thing, but I would like to support that level, um, you know, the in-depth technical um, audit. 
from from a frontier point of view, but from DES, I I would like us to take that our four thousand ish, three thousand, four thousand charge from our contracted services to get that audit done with the idea that we're going to get um, IRA money, Inflation Reduction Act money for solar, because that's apparently where the um, solar, I mean, that money is supposed to go to solar. So if we can get that, uh, figure out how we can get solar on the roof of the elementary, we can get, ho hopefully get the grants for the solar. So I'm a little confused on how that all works, but. Um, so well, you, we're going to do the level two. Right. No and see, can, can you attain this? And then you're still, then you're looking separately for so, money to right. figure out how to put. I'm solar. saying that I'm supportive of going to the next level for the elementary school, for sure, because we control the elementary school. But does that, does that next level get us anything? That gets, or, supposedly that gets us the engineering or the the idea that what do we have to do to get the solar and that way we could apply for grants under the there, solar i don't know if that's mixing two things is it or is are we well to tell you the truth i don't know how the, you know he said it's very in-depth um if it includes roof structure or, or even off-site so, structure so um, we we've got to get this money for solar but, somewhere but okay but, um i mean we got to get ready Yes. What's that, Casey? Um, the roof is not that old. So no, if we are going to do that, we need a much firmer idea of what we're looking at for technical assistance and cost. You yeah. can't you can't put solars directly on the roof. When I was on the roof committee, as he's talking, as Tim was talking, it would, would be a structure. It would be some kind of some other structure that would or some that. kind of internal supports. You got we got to do extra on the roof if we're going to put it on the roof or you could do some kind of external whatever before we would sign on to that spending the money out of contracted services let's just make sure that it would cover i mean if we're all we're going well, yeah, you know we we're doing the free one right and we'll get some idea of what can can we do and then is is that the right structure I, right vehicle to get i think solar first just going back to what darius said i, I want to assure you <laughs> that what we're trying to do is to get the ability to apply for grants to do the work at no cost to the school district. Um, and uh, as far as the solar, I think the municipal level audit may tell us that we're not even eligible for the deep energy retro. Right. Okay. But it may say, yeah, you are, yeah. and here's what you'll need to know, and and that's when we should go. For well, it. then that's what we should do is wait then See until what it says, what it yeah. says yeah. and then because I just don't want to miss the boat on yeah. the solar panels. Yeah. This there's no question you can reduce our operating costs, and we have to have air conditioning for the kids, and that's electricity. Yep. This is no different than putting the electric panels on the new library. I mean, it was ridiculous to design it with no electric plant. And, and furthermore, the green communities, though it isn't covering solar at the right. moment, it is covering mini splits like Grace. Yeah. So um, you yeah. can get more of it. So, uh, so we can let Darius go. I mean, we yeah. basically all yeah. agree that we, yeah. we are up to the level twos, so. right? Yeah. And the level twos will, on DES, will tell us whether we can bother to go ahead and spend the approximately $4,000 to do a deep energy retrofit of that building. Right. Um, uh, and then I wanted to ask, is this Matt that we were speaking to, these these yes. deep energy? Yeah. Um, I would like to see if we could get a, a level two on the 1821 building while we're at it, because it's gonna be a meeting space. It's still, it's a meeting space now. It's not being utilized for anything really, but, um, I think it would be worth finding Absolutely. out because that's got, it needs everything. It needs insulation. It needs windows. It needs everything. Yep. So um, if yep. we can get an, get an engineer to come in and look at that free, then we should. Yeah. Right. Okay. So it I, I, seems like we're on the same page. So let's, when we get the information from the level two, mm -hmm. let's try to figure out what the next move is. Yeah. Darius, if you, I know you have, they hate to come to meetings because you have so many, but if you, I think it's worth meeting again to 
to, to, to have the strategy of do we go forward with the, the next level energies or, or what's the next step? And we might have more information at that point. How do we get solar panels under the IRA money? Because I think to do like a centralized heat pump, you'd have to put duct work all through the building, right? I don't think there's duct work from room to room right now. Is there? I think they were because there's no. They were, and how do you there is a central? How, which building are you talking about? The frontier. The frontier. The classrooms are not. They're individual. They're individual units. Yeah. The, obviously, the auditorium, the gymnasium are on a. On a air handler kind of system. So, yeah. do you how do you move air in and out of the building to meet the codes where you don't have to? No, each building, each classroom has its own uh, individual air shield yeah. unit with the outdoors. Yeah. Okay. So every every room in that building has its own individual air handler. I don't want to say every building, but the but regular the classroom. classrooms, the mm -hmm. thirty six regular. I can pull that number out of the yeah. air. I could be wrong. Sure. Have individual. You go in. There's a big box that's connected with the outdoors. The damper to the outdoors and brings air in, and then we run Dampers. off of you know hot water. Yeah. To yes, you know, where the boilers are running mm -hmm. um, to heat that air coming in. Right. So you're really pumping a lot of hot air into this air you're sucking in from outside during the winter to keep the correct. Room depending on and so obviously like, you know an example is during COVID we opened up the dampers completely to get the amount of fresh air completely, mm -hmm. sending our electric bill. I mean not our electric bill but our Gas fuel costs. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Because you had to execute that was we part of the requirement. Oh, yeah. Exchange, exchange, exchange. And we just broke small. Yeah. Right. Um, but, you know, so, but, yeah, but that's so how the, the right thing to do, obviously. Right. But, so yeah. you can't just add to, uh, yeah. that's one of the problems with, yeah. you know, Frontier, is that it's, and then yeah, it's but also, there's also the nice benefits. Question, like, how much more money you want to put into a building you're probably going to be replaced in 25 years. That's true. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know what I mean? And so that yeah. kind of thing, like, do we start planning Sure, a new building. You know, yes. I, mean, I know I won't be around for that part of it, but well, at some point, you know, mm -hmm. that's where you know the, some of these new technologies is tough. Exactly, putting into an old system, right? right. But that's why I just want to make sure we take advantage. Yeah, if there's of something the grant to do before we replace the, the building for sure. The, and since we don't have the dollars coming. into it for the level twos, there's really no there's right. no reason not to do it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, even if we don't end up being able to ad adopt on any of them because of the reasons you're saying, you know, yeah. 20, 25 year life expectancy. Well, uh, we're having that conversation with the capital committee about the roof. Right. Yeah. The current roof is reading end of life. And the question mm -hmm. is, do you put a 25, 30, 40 year roof on it? Well, we're starting to say, well, is the, what's this building going to be, you know, what's the, yeah. the building going to be probably retro in 30 years? Mm -hmm. So, you know, do you, right. you know, so and because there's a huge amount, when you're talking about the amount of roofing, we're doing hundreds of thousands of difference, yeah. Yeah. you know, and so, you know, but it's interesting. It's an interesting thing to be thinking about right. trying to end of life of the building and retroing at the same time. Right. And how much any will you save in that retro in that time frame with exactly. some of these upgrades as well? You know, kind right. of balancing that off as well. And where with all these different capital projects, where to put the energy and the money now yeah. versus versus other things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, this well, this really it, it, yeah. just as an illustration, I, I think not looking backwards, but looking forwards, um, we've started to try to use the energy committee expertise that we have. Like we have Jay Curtis, who's a tie-in bond engineer, looking at the HVAC system for the the police department to see if the bid that we're looking at makes sense um, over a 20, 25 year life uh, time period. And so going forward, you know, I'd like to say that we think there's value in having the energy committees from the four towns and in in the uh, the regional system being able to be a part of conversations about energy use in the buildings because I, these people care, they're willing to do the research. They're also willing to be told no if, hey, it doesn't make financial sense. But um, so going forward, I'd like to really encourage that we try to take advantage of that in some formal way. So whatever you could do, Darius, to help move that along, I would really appreciate. Well, I already appreciate what you're doing now, Darius. It's, it's really, it's good to hear. Um, and uh, we'll get more conversation when we get this level two done. Yeah. And um, then we'll talk about the level three. I mean, it's this money from the Inflation Reduction Act is very elusive. Um, we are trying to chase this down in any way, whatever programs. And I, I know they're putting money in solar. We've been notified that on multiple different it comes up on my stuff. YouTube feed all the time. I know. So <laughs> we've got to figure out how we can access that because that will have a huge uh, impact on your operational budget if we can get that installed. 
on in the schools. So that's why we're interested. Yep. Or I'm interested because that will make a big difference. And the air conditioning situation is only going to get worse. I mean, you're going to be running the air conditioners more than you have ever done. Yeah. Um, it, we're seeing that way into October now, and you're seeing it in April. How many, and to the end of school. How many how many more rooms do you think you need at DES after these eleven? Um, I actually have a map of it. Yeah, I, that's okay. I, I, just I can shoot an email. With yeah, it, that's fine. it's probably uh, use like eight more rooms, maybe. Okay. Classrooms. Okay. And then the question of whether or not we want to do big spaces, you know. Right. Um, at one point, we were looking at whether or not we would do the main cafetorium. Yeah. Because then you could have a cooling center for the community. During Absolutely. Summer, you know, the summer camps run. Yeah. That's that's big money and. It's a huge open. it's a big space and the, you yeah. know and then i would worry about you know we start going on the other things there how well how is it much? insulated for that kind right of thing? throwing money out the yeah out literally, literally out the roof well the good thing, thing about cooling is it sinks so you're yeah, not gonna true. have to worry about it going off the roof yeah um you know you're gonna have to worry that it's gonna rise up enough to keep the heat coming down from the roof but uh yeah yeah it's a true. it's a good good question those air conditioners are also heaters and right. they're not being used for that. So it's right. also um, mm -hmm. a, a, another way to be resilient. We can use them either way. Mm -hmm. yeah. We do use them in office spaces and such for heating yeah. Yeah. and stuff, but it's a general classroom. Um, yeah. You I mean, have the ability, but at the same time, so you deal with these things if they're not interconnected. So exactly. Yeah, you, people leave. We also have interesting management problems because yeah. you oh, can't yeah. have. Folks coming in and say, I want to set my room to 63 because I like it cold. Yeah. Right. And you know what I mean? And you got to move the air. Yes. You got to yeah. keep the CO2. Up. Yeah. Um, well, I'm sorry okay. we're, we have yeah. such a tight schedule okay. tonight, but I, I wanted to thank you, Darius well, and David it. both yeah, for thank you. being here. Thank and, you, David. Um, thank you. Thank you, Annie. Very much, Thanks, Annie. Annie. Uh, thank you for being aware of what's going on. That's wonderful. Okay. Thank you, Darius. Good night. See you. All right. All right. So next on our agenda is the town of Conway. Um, I know I see Phil and I see Veronique um, on. Hey, Phil. Hi, Phil. Hello, hello. hello. Thank Hi, you. Veronique. Welcome. So Welcome. Um, this is a, we have this on, as a joint meeting. So I'm just going to take two seconds and call the Conway Select Board to order. So there we go. Sure. Sure. Um, so that's that's that. Okay, um, <laughs> two seconds. But, um, so thank you very much for um, for talking to us. Um, I believe one of our members, Erica Goldman, um, won't be long on this call because she has a prior commitment at seven. But um, okay, what what I was hoping to achieve, and if, if it's okay if I just start, Caroline. Um, no, oh yeah, yeah, go ahead, Phil. Uh, is is just sort of the, my conversations with both you and Trevor. If we could just have those again with the select with the rest of the select board and with um, Veronique and um, Adam Reed is also on he's the assistant to the town to the town administrator um, and so because this is this is information that I didn't know before and this is a direction that I have uh, I was very intrigued and um, but I wanted to get all of us in Conway on the same uh, I don't know the same wavelength so um, and, and uh, I realized you were far more coherent in your conversation than I was in my ability to repeat your conversation. So, um, well, I, it's because um, I've been around for a long time, Phil. And, <laughs> yeah. um, my first event was in 2005. Uh, Upper Road collapsed. Mill Village was falling into the Mill Village Road was falling into the river, and the sewer treatment plant was uh, in front of the sewer treatment plant was caving in. Um, to the river. So um, that I didn't know what to do really. And um, we were trying to get someone to come and you must realize that this was in 2005. This was the year of Katrina. There was FEMA was a wreck. There wasn't really much infrastructure for re emergency response at that point. Uh, but Greenfield had people in that trailer park got washed away. They had gr they had people in the shelter for like two or three weeks. We couldn't get anyone out here from the state. Uh, it was it was terrible. And the only person that came was the, the was a district conservationist with NRCS, 
Natural Resource and Conservation Service. And that's how I got involved with the Conservation District because they literally handheld my um, hand through the entire response. We've had, over the years, we've had millions and millions of dollars worth of damage here in the town of Deerfield with flooding and um, washouts, and the town has paid very little. And, you know, we have about an 18 to $20 million loss right now, more than Irene, more than what we had in Irene. Mm -hmm. And it is overwhelming, but you just got to be calm, just like all the damages that you all have. Um, you have to do response in phases, and it's a little bit at a time. And so your first response is emergency stabilization and getting the roads back open so you can get emergency vehicles, ambulances, fire trucks, police to people, and people can get out and, and resume their regular day. So this in Deerfield of our 20 million, 4.7 million is probably what it will take to, to get us ready for the winter. Okay, so what you all, I don't, I don't really know how you're looking at your damages, but if you, you have to look at it in like a three phase thing, you have your emergency, like I said, stabilization, get the roads open, then you have fix it the way it was which got washed out. So that's not really where you want to go, but that's part, it's beyond emergency stabilization. And then you have the resiliency. Your recovery on any events like Irene or this event for us is a three to five year process. You cannot get freaked out that it's going to take three to five years, but that's how you're going to end up with 18 or $20 million dollars reinvested in your town infrastructure that you as taxpayers in town haven't paid for. Um, what? So the first process, I guess I would say, is you need to come up with your emergency stabilization response oh, road opening, uh, uh, you know, amount. What is that amount? That has got to go to Paul Mark. I have right. not heard him being responsive to you at all. Joe, Joe Comerford and Natalie Blay have been in our town multiple times to our July 10th event, our July 16th event, and our July 21st event. They've been had staff here, they had people here. I, I don't know really what Paul has done in your town, but he needs to get on the hook and you need to sort him out. Yes, for Veronique. Hi, I just wanted to say that actually they've been incredibly responsive. Um, oh, good. Great. Paul, yeah, good. yeah, very much so. Paul's been here. Natalie's been here multiple times driving the roads. Awesome. Um, okay. And we've had many, many, you know, other legislators here. So yeah, they've been great. wonderful. That's great. good. So then what you need is, do you have your opening amount? What, how do you get your roads open? Do you know what your, that amount is, that dollar amount? 3.9, 3. Point, almost 3.9 for the, uh, the, 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 for the 10th, it was like 400 and something thousand. And for the 21st, it was three point, I mean, uh, two, yeah, 3.4 something. Yep. Now, um, do, you, do you have that number to, to MEMA and FEMA right now? We, we do. The deadline was Monday. Um, right. And and that so and we and we got the uh, approval to spend that amount in deficit which okay. is which is not uh not my desired outcome of course that's one of the reasons why we're here because uh fema mema governors the, the absence of the governor's disaster declaration er, the absence of biden's de disaster declaration um uh, you know i don't i'm 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 looking for alternatives and uh, in our in our Nation, you flesh alternatives. But you need to get that amount. That's cash. There's nothing you can do about that. You need that cash to be coming from the state. Yeah. So what we need to do is towns as we join together and we start saying, you know, talk to the Senate president, Karen Spil Spilka, and say, we just like for the farmers, 
we need X number of dollars for our communities. And if it's just, if it's 3.9 for you and it's 4.7 for, for, for us, we already have a huge chunk. And, and that's what we need. Berkshire towns and there was Berkshire towns that had additional damage. So combined, that's what we need cash. Okay. Now, worst case scenario in my mind is that they're going to do a supplemental budget and we'll get our money. Okay. But that's not until October. And what we need to do is we need to keep hounding them to see if they could do a special deal where they can give us some storm damage money so that we don't have to borrow money to um, do those kind of repair, pay for those kind of repairs. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then yeah. the next level your of response is what was there replacing what was there and protecting what was there and that's your emergency watershed protection program through the natural resource and conservation service okay that is a fantastic program like i said in 2005 uh they we, we did um mill village we did in front of the sewer treatment plant uh, we didn't get help for Upper Road, but um, through that program. But those two projects were well over a million and a half dollars each, and um, they not a, a rock or a section of that was was hurt in Irene or the terrible right. flooding of two thousand of of the tenth, the sixteenth, or you know last July of twenty one or. Because it you was know, kind of resilient. It's it's it was built out correctly, and those are the kind of things that you want. That uh, what that does is um, you don't need a declared event because it's unlikely we're going to get a declared event from FEMA and MEMA. And the reason why is because um, they're looking at this as July 10th, 16th, and 21st as three different events. We're not going to get enough money to meet the threshold. Threshold, mm -hmm. even though I think one of the other things you got to do in this emergency part is to um, survey your citizens. We, we put in a couple hundred thousand dollars, as you know, because people's driveways washed away, and I mean, yeah. just on Upper Road, I know there's at least three driveways that got really damaged, but um, that I was driving by constantly, but all over town there was small damage it's not going to do much you know we're not sure if there's going to be any dollars for that but you all as when i was talking to phil you all have substantial personal private yeah. damage yes so every single person is if that goes to fema and mima uh because there might be help. There isn't a lot of help if it's not a declared emergency up front. You need to tell people that. But you need to put that dollar amount to MEMA and FEMA because the state might do some kind of special package of, of some portion of that loss. And they'll need receipts. And so you got to, people need to document what they're doing. And what I did is I talked th through Phil on his own personal situation where the water was whooshing through, you know, you can't, you just have to put an estimate out, but you never get somebody to come look at your foundation without, for five, for less than 5,000. And the water was going through the foundation. You know, you had oil tanks that uh, tipped over and you got cleanup. Boilers. And boilers for a big old house and, and uh, electrical panels that you might want on the first floor instead of in the basement. So that's going to be some electrical, you know, um, reconfiguration. All those things, when you add them up, you're over 50 to 75,000 already. So you just need ballparks from all estimates from all your people that um, were damaged so that you can get that out to the um, MEMA people too, and to Joe and Paul and and Natalie so that they know that maybe you can only get 25% and you got to have, you know, uh, some receipts. But if you replace your boiler, Phil, you know, you're going to have a receipt for that. So, uh, be, you know, Hold on to your receipts and see if there's going to be something in the state budget for something like that. Okay. Um, 
Okay. No, go. Oh, so anyway, back to the EWP, after you've done the personal damage part and get that down there, um, the EWP does not need a declared event, which in our case is perfect. So that means any event that we have, any rainstorm or high water event in the rivers, you can have them come out to your town. And the state engineer, Darren Davis, is really, really nice. And he'll help you put together, can you do this? I mean, I would look at Field Hill Road, who, which is, oh, you know, that was a wreck. So what do you need to do to fix that so it doesn't wash out in the next storm event? Um, and so you would have him come out. They used to, in 2005, there was a lot more staff in state, so you could get the design done here. But Darren and his staff will take all the measurements and do all the stuff on site, and then they do the design work in Texas now, but they do wonderful design work still. So what happens is the front loading of any project you know is permitting and um, design, which is like 40 to 50% of every project. So if you don't have to front load that, and then they pay 75% of installation, that's a fantastic win-win for you as a community because you're gonna get it put back correctly and engineered to withstand the next storm event. And it has to happen within 220 days because it's done under emergency. So it's wicked fast. You can do it right away. Uh, we have we have River Road, we have Little Meadow Road, we have Pine Nook Road, we have um, a couple places on Lower Road that that have um, landslide kind of issues. So we have several projects. We hope that will um, be eligible for EWP. Um, I had a meeting. Uh, EWP is not front front loaded. Uh, from NRCS's point of view, I had a meeting of the Northeast uh, Conservation Group on Monday. Uh, it was the earliest I could get the group together, but um, everyone supported, voted, and supported um, getting their congressional um, delegation to support funding EWP because Vermont, of course, was devastated. There was yeah. damage in New Hampshire and Western Maine and New York State. And so a um, couple of years ago, the West Virginia had terrible mm -hmm. uh, raining uh, issues, and they used a lot of EWP. So they were getting their delegation together for us, and everybody is supportive of making this funding available immediately. So that's really good news. Um, you've had a lot of work done in the South River by the FERCOG. And some of the work has been done by best practices through NRCS again. So there's a lot of information there that might, if there was damages along the South River, you might be able to get some funding for that kind of stuff. For It's for erosion. It's, um, it's relieving anything that's imminent to life and property, which is a pretty big uh, definition. So if you can think that it's your property damage or your life, you know, your house or person's life, roads, those things all included. Um, it's infrastructure recovery, which means that anything that they will protect, they will, they'll figure out a way to protect your infrastructure. And that was why I was thinking of Field Hill Road, because um, you know, that washed out quite a bit and then you restored it so people can go up and down, but you know, it's not, it's not stable enough to last, you know, for uh, even through the winter, maybe, you know, who so knows? Can we let Veronique ask? Oh yes, Veronique, go ahead. You're muted. Sorry. Yeah. Um, well, I did want to mention that we have talked to, um, uh, EWP, actually, they're probably going to be here on Friday. Shelburne Falls Road is one of the ones that we're really concerned about. Um, and I feel till too. But um, my understanding, and maybe you can clarify this for me, is that when it comes to private um, damages, the town has to be like a partner or a support with that. Can you maybe explain that a well, little more? 
what it is is um, they do a damage survey report to show that you're eligible for the program, and they'll give you an estimate of the project. Say it's a million dollars, they pay seventy five percent. So there's a a, a difference of two hundred fifty thousand, say, in the project. What we've done in the past is it's easier to go through the conservation district as a sponsor because the cons when when irene happened it, you know the towns were overwhelmed and like ashfield had a house that was going in the river and so from a private point of view the conservation um, district worked with that homeowner and the difference was i think sixteen thousand dollars or something uh, they were armoring the bank by the house, so the house didn't tip in the river. And the difference between the complete installation was like $16,000. And so the um, conservation district worked as the sponsor, was the sponsor with the homeowner, and we just figured out how the homeowner was going to pay the $16,000 and paid the conservation district, and the conservation district paid the EWP program. Um, when the grant got in. And what will happen, uh, we have already requested help from um, EWP program. And what will happen is we got to figure out once the estimate of the project amounts are, all we have to do as a town is just say that we're going to pay the match. And then we have to come up with a way to cover the match. And like Little Meadow Road is next to Deerfield Academy and it's the main sewer line to Deerfield Academy. So hopefully Deerfield Academy will pick up the difference for us in Little Meadow Road. Similarly, High Nook is next to Eagle Brook School. So if we have an EWP project on Pine Nook Road, Eagle Brook will pick up the difference. But that's for us to get cash from them um, not our taxpayers, um, based on where the project is. On the if roads, we'd obviously have or to pay. If, right, if if that's what's going to happen. Uh, you just have to figure out where you're going to get um, the match. And the match can be the difference between what we get from our state legislators and what we've already invested in our roads for emergency. Mm. So... The, okay. the other thing that I wanted to mention, the other program w which we're doing now, uh, because we have a sewer system, we're doing a um, asset management plan to look at uh, all the sewer pipes in town. We did that before, before we started our large project, but they're also um, the state revolving fund is has a, a, a grant program where you can get up to 150000 to do um, asset management of stormwater. I don't know if the it's like getting close to the close on the application process, but you know there might be another one next year. Or I'm not sure what the time frame is, but we're um, you know we're going to have a uh, we put in for a grant to assess all of our stormwater, so any kind of catch basins and culverts and um, manholes, all that kind of stuff. We're hoping to get listed into a plan so we'll have at least a, a document and, you know FERCOG did a lot of um culvert we have a, work we have for a culvert us. plan the culvert plan and and we're hoping to tie it all together so we can get a good understanding of what what is undersized what do the pipes look like they'll run cameras through the pipes and um and and put all this into a large book or obviously on um digital database as well that we could we could kind of have a good understanding of what's failed, what's old, what needs to be redone, what should we up, you know, increase any of the pipes that we're replacing because they were washed out. We're trying to do with larger stuff as well to try to deal with, you know, the amount of water that's coming seems like every week. But um, so that that's a program, you know, that might be available if you wanted to to take a look at that as well. V Vernique, did you have another question? Um, yeah, thank you. I, I was just curious if, because I know, you know, we have roads that we use in common, and is there any area where our two towns can apply for things jointly? Yeah. Yes. Well, this is where the resiliency part comes in, and this is where it gets to be the dragged out part of the recovery. But the important part of that is, is you are looking for hazardous mitigation grants 
or the BRIC grant, which is building uh, resiliency infrastructure. infrastructure and communities. And um, the BRIC grant is, is fairly competitive. Um, and hazardous mitigation grant is a separate pool of money, and that's national. BRIC is a national mm -hmm. competitive grant. The hazardous mitigation grants are from the state, um, and that pot of money varies from year to year. That depends on how many federally declared emergencies, and it's like 10% of the money. So if we had like $2 billion of like pandemic uh, declaration, then you're going to get 200 um, million in the uh, pot for hazardous mitigation, that kind of thing. So um, it's usually 75%, again, 75%. So you have to look where are you going to make up that 25% in kind. And that's one other thing I just want to go back to the EWP. EWP is very, very good about in-kind services if you have, you know, highway department um, participation in anything, it counts towards your 25%, which is really important. And we've been able to um, make a huge difference in the contribution amount because of our uh, participation of the highway department. Um, so anyway, the resiliency is a one-time fix. In other words, you're doing, you're upgrading your culverts, you're figuring out how you're going to do stuff, um, and and so it's a you don't have to go back and do it. Um, MVP we've done culverts replaced through the MVP program. Um, we had a horrible contractor for Kelleher Drive, but we did get a finally you know we, they did pay for an open bottom culvert there. We had an open bottom culvert on Mill Village that was paid for by MVP program. Um, we uh, and that was. Uh, like four years ago, mm -hmm. but I mean, that was from Irene. The other one on open bottom culvert on um, Mill Village was also from Irene, but uh, we, the conservation district paid for that through fines that were deep from DEP. They gave uh, the conservation district money. So we were able to buy um, open bottom culvert for Mill Village. Both of them work beautiful. Um, you know, in all these storms, and um, we hope to never have to really do anything more with them. And that's the kind of thing that you want to be able to do is have built in that resiliency. The other thing that we did for Irene is uh, the conservation district um, has a work group called Creating Resilient Communities, which um, I chair. We've been meeting since December of 2011. Uh, it's the 20 communities up and down the Deerfield River plus um, Vermont. Uh, we work with our sister conservation district, Wyndham County Conservation District in Vermont. And we have federal and um, state partners at the table. And what we've done from Irene was we adopted the Vermont, we had Vermont come down and show us and convince this mass DOT um, that their rivers and road standards were really great. And the mass DOT adopted those standards. Then they did trainings here in town. Uh, the conservation district did trainings. We've had field geology come in and show our highway departments how rivers move. Um, and that is was great. But the next stage that will be really mindful for all of us is we're gonna to put together a training, hopefully um, when Vermont is able to recover, um, is they have essentially had mud season nine months of the year because of warming of winters. And they've come up with a technology of bio um, fiber technology that they put down on the roads. It's essentially eliminated mud season, but it also has stabilized the roads. And they and the, and the upside of it is that they've had far few, I mean, far less washouts because of the drainage and compaction. I have not taken any trainings, so I'm not sure how the technology works, but as a creating resilient communities, we're gonna get Vermont to come down. We'll do some kind of demonstration. Hopefully Mass DOT again will buy into it and we'll be able to do some kind of replacement on our roads. And then so Kevan, I'm gonna turn it over yeah, to Kevin. Carolyn's talking about gravel roads, correct? Yes. Yeah. And I'm gonna turn it over to Kevin to talk about, hopefully that would be the ideal thing to do would be to get 
replacement of our common roads with this new technology. But Matthews, uh, Matthews and Hoosick Road and that kind of thing. But I'm going to turn it over to Kevin so he can talk about trying to work together with you. Um, <clears throat> good afternoon, everyone. Uh, hopefully, basically, where we're at is, is we're just trying to go ahead and Matthews Road has been, for the most part, been put back together. Uh, that was one of our main focuses in the beginning of trying to stabilize uh, roadways because we knew when 116 being out, that was your your main way in and out. Uh, we were very fortunate. We were able to get uh, contractor Cocot in there and they they worked tirelessly for a couple of days to make sure that that road was opened up. Um, Huzik, Huzik's a little bit different story. Um, it's gonna take a little bit more time. I have received some uh, some quotes on it. Um, I'm still waiting on at least one more quote. That way I can stay within the radar of the uh, auditors when they come in the spring. <clears throat> um, like I said, there, there's a couple different options we're looking at there. Um, but we're definitely trying to make sure that this gets done over the next 30 days. And that way I stay within my emergency and, and we're able to um, get that road open back up again. Um, when Carolyn was talking about the what, uh, excuse me, Vermont does, uh, they got a fantastic system up there. They, they finally got it figured out. <clears throat> and uh, it'd be nice for us to be able to uh, get what they've already figured out, you know, um, if, if you want to talk about some place that that's got mud season, um, that's upper Vermont and you know, it's almost like uh, tundra, whatever that stuff is up in Alaska, where, where it's, it's, it's just soft all the time. Um, so that's basically where, where we're at as far as those couple roads, you know, the other two roads, dirt roads that I have that I have issues with um, presently right now, they both go into Shelburne. Um, so that doesn't affect um, obviously Conway at this point in time. But we're we're getting there, you know. It's it's been it's been a hell of a pull. Um, you know, it's 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 devastating. You know, there's a lot that both of our towns went through. Obviously, you guys have, um, you know, the fortunate of being able to be called the uh, the most water in one month in the entire country and Canada. That's um, and yeah. I think we were like three or four or something like that. Um, but long story short is, is you know, um, uh, Ron, you know, Ron's been like, you know, going absolutely crazy trying to make sure that he gets his stuff done. Um, and, and just, I just hope people understand that there's so much devastation in both of our towns that they got to give us a little bit of leeway to get things opened up. Um, you know, you've got somebody that's complaining about three inches of water in their, their garden compared to, you know, I've, I've got a road that's completely washed out and I've got 15 people that can't get fire police or EMS. Um, obviously those are, are what we need to look at. Um, fortunately we're open. Everything is open now where everybody's able to get to where they need to get to. Um, but they just may take a long way around. You know, we've got lower road, which again, really doesn't, it's going to kind of affect you a little bit. <clears throat> Cause I know a lot of people utilize Hoosick road. <clears throat> Once Hoosick's open back up again, you know, definitely, uh, lower road should be opened up. Cause I know everybody uses that as their cut through to go up to Greenfield. Um, so that, that's basically what we're trying to get to. Um, it's, it's going to be a little bit of a haul, you know, like Carolyn says, you know, the, the four is to get us back to where we were for the most part. Yeah. And, and the extra is going to be to, to get us where we need to go to. So. I think, I think the main thing too is, um, mm -hmm. it's just my nervousness is just really, we just need to work together as communities and reach out to other communities that have been affected so that we can, um, really make you know, take this message home to our legislatures that we need this funding. We we just can't, I know you can't either even begin to figure out how you're going to pay for all of that, you know, manpower and materials. Um, so that that is the main thing is just working with 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 Paul and um, Natalie and Joe and everybody yeah. to kind of to kind of get some sort of bill in before before the June 30th so we can uh, we can recover a bit. Um, and, you know, Trevor, honestly, that's my, you know, um, the, having been through Hurricane Irene 2011 and knowing that the appropriation from the state arrived in our town hall at, in 2018, um, <laughs> uh, you know, the, 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 the promise of just doing it through the state house um, yes. just does not hold much allure for me. Um, um, that's all we have. Uh, they're, they're yeah, but they Phil, will we can't. They'll come through. Phil, yeah, will. They'll come through. We have to say right now we have $8.6 million between the two of us that we need to get immediately. They need to do this. They did it for the farmers. They can do it for us. There's the Berkshires have 
put they were going to do a separate bill for the Berkshires and they yep. they stopped that so that they could do a combined bill. But they should be able to do this right away based on our MEMA numbers right now. Yeah. And we should be getting, we should make sure you get your 3.9 and we get our 4.7 and then we move to the next stage. This is this is only to get us, you know, Back whole open. again in the sense that you can open the roads and they're stable. But that doesn't mean they're even going to make it through the winter. You yep. know, that's that's the right. next phase. Exactly. And and that's what's really well, we have a few I, short I mean, months. Yeah. A few short months to get the road stable for winter. I mean, we're and, uh, both highway departments need to be they should work together yep. so that we can figure out what we're going to do for the winter because these fixes are not winter eyes fixes. Mm -hmm. And um, and that's why we're hoping that because it's July, we can work through NRCS and use the EWP program to get most of the stuff in by December. And um, and that, that will be our worst roads, mm -hmm. you know, our worst condition roads at this so point. In, in the last 30 seconds, does Conway have any other questions they have for us? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm sorry to make you. Oh, no, that, that, that's um, we. Just, you know, one is just like a nuts and bolts question about how do we get started with the conservation district application? And, um, and, and I, you know, I, if, if, well, if it that. Sounds like, it sounds like Ver Vernique is getting the um, um, NRCS out there, Darren Davis EW. out there to do the damage survey um, report. And that will, and that will indicate to you whether, how many projects you have there are EWP eligible and that is going to be able to you're going to do a much better fix with the ewp than what just to stabilize it and get it open it's the next step and then you got to look at the whole picture like we're going to apply for a 604b planning grant through to dp to look at the water that comes down on river road because we have the whole river road, there's at least two or three spots that are sinking and that were really devastated with runoff from Pine Nook Road on the Connecticut River side. And then we have all this silt uh, going into the Deerfield River that's going into Long Island Sound. So we hope to get an impaired river definition so that for the Deerfield River from Stillwater Bridge down to the mouth of the Connecticut based on sewage coming in from Greenfield's plant in the Green River and then dumping it into Deerfield and then all our silt. So, Carolyn, is there any possibility that you can take this offline and talk to yes. Barbara? Well, Inc. no, or, they or wanted Phil? to know. Yeah. Well, I understand that. It's just yeah. that we've got somebody calling in from Colorado that we need to deal oh, with. Oh, yeah. Okay. And, um, you know, but anyway, it 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 seems like it's complicated, but you need to look at the big picture, and that's your three to five year window. And you just can't get depressed about it because that's just what it costs um, to do it at not taxpayer dollars. Let's let's keep in touch. Let's yeah, let's do that. Work together to try and get. And for Nick, you can just call me, and I we can I can try to sort it out. I, I'll make sure that Darren has your phone number and stuff like that. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Carolyn, Trevor. Thank yeah. you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah. No, we'll any keep, anytime keep you have together, a question, please. you can call yeah. me. I mean, thank you, Chris. I've been just doing this for a while, so. Yeah. yeah. I know. Yeah. Call anyway. <laughs> now it's a lot different than 2005. Uh, yes. So much. Hey, thanks, Good night, guys. guys. We'll see you yeah. soon. Good night. All right. Good night. Thank appreciate you. It. Um, oops. But, uh, sorry, I just so sorry. Oh, I know they have um confidence analytics. All right, are they are see. they here? Nick, oh, yes. Nick, the, uh, I see Nick they, is here. Okay, um, we have the host agreement here. Second, it was Nick. We just wanted to make sure that we're moving forward on this and. There seemed to be some question on uh, what about taxes? Yeah, and I think I think I saw a letter fixing that, right? Yes, uh, Casey. So 
there was one outstanding issue related to the payment of taxes. Um, council outlined what that, what the issue was there. The company requested modification of the standard language. However, as a compromise, Liz Lydon, who's our, who's been working, our attorney working with us on this, recommends inclusion of the exact language of general laws, chapter 40, section 57, and preserving the rights of the company to challenge a revocation, but removing the language that limits liability of the company to the portion being leased. So the issue is, is if the owner doesn't pay the taxes and the leasee still needs to operate, there is an opportunity to revoke that license. Now, the statute outlines an entire process to do that, which includes a hearing. Um, but the question is, is valid. What happens if the owner is in taxes, but we still want to operate? And I might be misrepresenting that, Nick, but I'm trying to sort of streamline it. So if I miss something, please let me know. Essentially, um, of language that limits the board's ability to take action under the statutes that taxes are not paid could be an issue. So the other piece is, is the board doesn't have the authority to waive a statute. Um, and that's the statute is directly related to the tax payments. So it also isn't in their best interest. So inclusion of the language that is a red line that you'll see um, could allow the property owner to continue collecting rent from the company, even if the property owner doesn't pay taxes. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean that the company leasing is liable for those taxes, only that the revocation of the license is a tool available to the select board to encourage the property owner to pay those taxes. And so that was a discussion we had. Nick, would you like to share your thoughts? No, I mean, I, I think you mostly got to the crux of it. I may not have the same red line version that you have in front of you. It, the way you just described it doesn't sound like what I have most recently seen. But yeah, I mean, the crux of the issue is we as tenants just don't want to feel that we are responsible for right. or potentially responsible for the tax obligations of our landlord, especially given that we don't know what those tax obligations are and we don't know if they've been paid. Um, and so... The way we see it is that is this statute says that the town may use that as a tool, um, but not that the town must. Um, right. And in fact, states that the town has the option to, I believe it says, the town may exclude um, that section from its bylaw. So, uh, you know, we were just hoping for a little bit of relief here. I have to take this back to my board, and my board doesn't particularly feel excited about this unknown liability that we don't have control over and feels really outside of the normal course of business. Um, we're just not familiar with situations where a tenant could lose their business license for their landlord's failure to pay taxes. Yeah. And one of the things that we mentioned to Nick in the meeting was the fact that um, by virtue of the hearing process outlined in the statute, um, there is the opportunity for the tenant to come forward and discuss this with the board and the board can make a decision not to revoke a license. Right. Um, it's simply, if particular language is in this HCA that creates, it, it essentially takes the, the select board's rights away um, or counter, counters the statute, that's, that's of concern. Um, because the statute we can't change as not staff people, as select board members, that's something that has to happen on a legislative level. And I did mention to Chris that this is relatively new in Massachusetts and not all the clunkiness has been worked out. So there's some cautiousness on both sides. Yeah, I see. I see the change. Yeah, <laughs> We're, we've crossed out the liability obligations with respect to the real estate property tax and excise tax for the company rebate something nick only to five thousand yeah and then you yeah it, well actually that, i think that was years. that might have been that might have been your language nick right you suggested that 
you might feel more comfortable if it was just limited to the 5,000 square foot structure. That's right. We we suggested that it, if it were limited to just the pro rata share of our portion, because this is a large campus, right? And so right. we're potentially liable for the property taxes of, I don't know, it's 26 acres or something. Yeah. I don't even know what else goes on on the property, the value of the other structures. We were asking for just a pro rata share of our 5,000 square feet to be our only liability in this regard. Still seems a little outside of normal, but that would at least make it easier for us to stomach. That language got added in at our request and then redacted. And I'm not sure why. Yeah. I think because they I think because they all they cross that out and just said that confidence will be notified in the event of property tax or excise tax um, default by the landlord and afforded a hearing and a reasonable opportunity to, to cure prior to license revocation. So just we'd come and have a talk about it, I think. Also, I think the important thing is, if I'm understanding uh, you correctly, Casey, and the emails we saw earlier, um, MGL Chapter 40, Section 57B states, this is a state law, it's nothing we can change, but it does say may, and you're correct, Nick, to say, it gives us the uh, the licensing authority the discretion may deny, but in the in this instance, yeah, if that? if the sunny days people default on their taxes, who's the first one we're going to come after? Yeah. with the license revocation, it's not going to be you. Um, we're going to go after sunny days, yeah. and that's we, what I was trying to get to. And and sunny days is the one that has the most to lose because they're not only growing the product. They're processing the product and they're selling the product. Right. And so we have far more to gain by using our lever, our leverage with the person who has the most, right. who has number one, the responsibility to pay the taxes and number two, the most incentive to pay the taxes. Plus they want to be a profitable business and there's no, no profit in not paying your taxes. They also want you there, Nick. And so that's a piece that didn't come up when we spoke yesterday, but really the people with the most to lose, I think Tim's right, is sunny days, because I honestly think you're right. This is a big campus and you're one piece of it. And I don't think, I mean, this is pretty rare. We'd even have this issue because they're going to be paying their taxes and they want to run their business and right. investing so much in this you know right really we, we just want to reassure you that longer. we want you to come to right. town yeah and we want to do business with you so but i did caution nick that with the change in the makeup of the board sometimes we have to be careful about what language and what precedent we set yes mm -hmm. so I, this seems pretty reasonable this one so i would have to make it so back and what, well what, what we need to do i want to make sure that um I do think the board wants to move forward with this, Nick, right? Yes. yes. That's yes. what I'm hearing the three of you say. Absolutely. Sure. We want to move yeah. forward with uh, this. We'd love them in our town. Uh, this is similar. We have scheduled payments is similar to what we have in other host agreements. Um, and this is language that has to be in host agreements, according to Lou. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we've, most of our host agreements, this is standard for us, so I'm not concerned. I, I'm so really would like to record to approve this, and then I mean, he's still subject to their approval. Well, they, they still have to sign it, so well, they still have to look at it again. So, well, me, I, I so think we I'll send that to you later. We can approve it based on. Um, I would make the motion we approve it. Um, what we're seeing yeah. now and um, move forward on this because right. it will be another two weeks before we meet. So sounds good. So second. I'll second the motion. Yeah, and the only discussion I would have is to, Nick, please make clear to your board that this is a state statute. We're local select board member. We have no authority to change state law. And the reason why it's probably written this way is because the state, because this is a new industry, relatively new industry, um, they wanted to have as much, a, much ability to enforce um tax payments etc um and you know it it's the type of clause that's in the sunny days issue too i'm sure mm -hmm. so um it's not directed at you or your company uh it's not just that the state the state law requires it and and i would also say that you're not the person that we would come after <laughs> no it would be silly for us to do that 
You know, yeah, I understand. And, and, and I'll reiterate too, that we're, you know, we're really excited about the prospect of coming out to Deerfield. Yeah. Um, love to be a part of the community. Um, and, and, and also, right. This is probably, this is hopefully, and I think we all believe this is something that will never come up anyway. Right. Yeah, right. Days to pay their property taxes. Right. And, and so it was our understanding that we were negotiating this host community agreement independent of sunny days agreement you are with you are and so in that light we're looking at it and saying this clause doesn't seem and it sounds like even what the board is saying today this clause really doesn't apply to us because you're saying even in the event that right. there were a default on the taxes you wouldn't use this clause as leverage against us anyway you would use it against sunny days correct and so if that's the case we would just like to it would make my job a lot easier if it was if it was out of the agreement regardless of what this what general law states it's not allowed because it's part it of the statute the state law it's not our we choice have to, our hcas have to be written this way and i think liz made that clear yesterday um but again the intent is not to penalize one piece of this campus but to um make sure that all the operational aspects of the campus are meeting the needs under the requirements of the statute okay understood um Maybe one last question. I understand that this is being recorded. Uh, is it? How do I get a transcript of this meeting? It will make my job easier to talk to my minutes? board about what's discussed here. Generally, the minutes are are available. First of all, the recording is available online once it's been spooled up. We push it up to our YouTube channel. Um, second, the minutes are usually available within two weeks or so. I can't guarantee that exactly, but we try to keep it at two weeks to a month. Um, the actual transcript though, we actually have another, um, staff member that transcribes these minutes. Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll just look for the video. Maybe I'll connect with Chris to yeah. get that. I was going to say, yeah. Chris, sure. Chris can yeah, Nick, I'd be happy to send it along to you tomorrow. It goes up the next day. So I'll send I, you the link. As all right. I, well, I appreciate your time, uh, uh, to the town, um, select board members. Thanks for your time today. I really appreciate well, we it. We got to vote this. So yeah. we'll, what yes, we are looking forward to meeting <laughs> you in person. <laughs> All those in favor? Tim Hilchey, aye. Trevor McDaniel, aye. Carolyn S. I. Thank you very much. We, we're really looking forward to having um, your testing lab here. So um, please just convey that. Yep. We'll, we'll do. All right. Thank, thank you all for your time. Thank yeah, thank you. Good night. Take care. Sounds like you had a little one out there. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> OK. Um, we have uh, Valerie isn't going to make it tonight. Um, so we're moving on, uh, select board announcements. Uh, let's see what I want to hit on real quick. The 350th softball game, Northfield versus Deerfield is this Saturday, August 12th, 2 PM, uh, 12 PM at the West Northfield playground, Mount Hermon station road, Northfield, um, Northfield BFW food concession. Please come join us in a softball game with the two towns celebrating their 350 years in existence, uh, sponsored by the Northfield and Deerfield 350th committees, Northfield and Deerfield Recreation Departments, Friends of Deerfield, Northfield, uh, VFW post 9874. So that's going to be fun. Tim's going to do gonna his play. best. At winning uh, yeah, I'm carrying the bat for the select board. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you very also, much. Also, um, Deerfield Recreation summer concerts. There's new dates for, for the rainouts that we had. August 11th um, will be Chicken Wire, Chicken and Wire, uh, 6.30 to 8 p.m. Um, that must have happened. No, that's coming up, right? Yeah, that's coming up. Um, and then September 2nd is Cottonwood uh, at 5.30 to 7 p.m. Uh, these are uh, both take place on Memorial Field here behind the town hall, parking on uh, North Main Street and in front of town hall. There's no parking behind town hall because that's where the event happens. So please come in and join us. Should be good. Should be fun. Um, is there any other announcements? I just want to say thank you um, again to our highway department, our police department, our EMS. Everybody has been fire departments. We've been working so hard to respond to these events. It's people have been out straight. Kevin, poor Kevin has been running around with the crews. Um, and John Pachorek has been amazing uh, as our emergency manager. Uh, he has tons and tons of meetings he's gone to and met with contractors. And we've had contractors that really responded well. And so it's generally people have been coming together and it's been wonderful. 
Is there anything else you want to say? Um, it, it occurs to me that there's also um, a Deerfield singer songwriter who's going to be performing for, I think it's Friday at the library. Um, Aiden. Oh, um, Gray. Gray. Oh, yeah, he's wonderful. And, um, so just, you know, to remind people they can go see their native son before he takes off for the bright lights. And uh, I think that's it's seven o'clock, but check your uh, your local Facebook page. Uh, Board of Health uh, comments. I just want to say, as we all know, almost every single day, it seems like it rains a little bit. And so the mosquitoes are going crazy. Um, West Nile disease is circulating in the southern end of the valley. Uh, so it means it's moving up. So um, please patrol your yards as much as possible. Make sure there is no standing water in flower pots and any kind of thing you've got in your yard. Just make sure and use repellent. We have the Eldo Pictus in the last 10 years has become a, a daytime biter. And that's one of the species that does um, carry West Nile disease. So please, even if you're in the middle of the day, not dusk and dawn, like you really have to pay attention, even in the middle of the day, you have to pay attention. So please wear some um, bug spray or wear long sleeves and long pants. Also, because it's been so damp, we have had ticks that are spiking in normally the sum, summer sun dries out. They go in under leaf mold and they hang out in more moist areas during um, you know, the summer heat. Well, we've had so much moisture. They're hanging out by people's houses in their yards that normally don't happen this time of year. So we have a a uh, spike of tick bites and tick um, prevalence that we don't really normally have. So please pay attention to do tick checks if you're outdoors during the day. Is there anything else anyone wants to say? Okay, moving on. Um, South Deerfield Wastewater Treatment Facility Phase 1 Upgrades, change order number 12. Okay, I'll, I'll explain that to everybody. Yeah, well, so just one thing I did forget. I wanted to thank the planning board for clearing the way for the uh, solar field that we've been working on for so many oh, years yes. at their last meeting on Monday. Oh, and wonderful. So the- Exciting. Oh, yeah, yeah. great. And uh, oh, so that. hopefully there'll be work happening at some point soon. That's great. Oh, yeah. I didn't know that they did that. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. That's only that is, it all coming together. 10 year project. Oh, 20 for you. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. Been trying to get, that's been again, we've been trying to get solar on there since we capped the launch right. of landfill. Uh, Casey has one thought on that too. Um, DEP actually issued their post closure use permit, permit. for that facility. Right. I so, saw that. That was so huge. we're moving, we're moving along, which is good. Yeah, that's yeah. fantastic. News. It's huge, huge. Sorry, Trevor. No, that's no. okay. So there, uh, this is a change order for a uh, total change order price is 19. Well, no, that's the, that's the whole job. Let me find this here. Um, 135,668.14 increase in this. This is um, work that we're doing to the secondary clarifier. Um, the, Wait, it's our first clarifier. Okay. Yeah. So you've got um, replacing the weirs and the baffles when we raise the walls. So this is doing that work talking about resiliency and raising the walls of the uh, original clarifier. So we're gonna replace the baffles and the weirs. And then um, that was 16,607. Find the other part of it. Um, the We wanted to install uh, uh, fence slats to the, um, fence that we're going to put up along the property between the residence and the um, headworks building. We're still in a little bit of a discussion on size of fence, but we wanted to add some privacy to that. That fence is going to be fairly tall, so we're going to have to have it engineered. Um, we're in the midst of talking with Bob on that okay, and still trying to talk with the owner uh, near there. So this was adding... Um, instead of just putting a fence up, putting a fence up and putting slats in, which is uh, 11,677.31. Um, 
that may change though, just, just so you know. Um, the next item is the aeration tank fluid transfer. So when we swapped over and shut down the original aeration tank, the large square, um, so that we could start transferring over to the old square. You know, what we found in there was, you know, three feet of silt, um, all that stuff. So we had to rent um, vector trucks and piping to pipe most of that up to the headworks building and run mm -hmm. it through the headworks. And then we had to excavate out and take all the rest of the stuff out that was on the bottom so we could start splitting that aeration tank to make it look like the, the new aeration tank. So um, that was extra work that wasn't really included in the original job. I think it was four thousand five oh three thirty three, or no total total charge nineteen thousand. I might be reading the wrong numbers. Let me go back to this one. Eleven thousand nineteen for that, and then um, the the concrete work to the air uh, to the clarifier of number two, which is eighty five thousand to raise the walls. Um, and do all the concrete and rebar work for that. Um, so the uh, following are costs associated with the excavation that is required to make the concrete modifications to the clarifiers. So that is all of that. So the total is? 135668.14. Okay. Yeah. So I would make a motion to increase um, this change order number 12, or th cover the change order number 12 for $135,668.14. Second. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Tim Hilchey, aye. Trevor McDaniel, aye. Carolyn Ness, aye. Just to explain that clarifier again, um, we were hoping to kind of just raise the walls and just after all that engineering, um, we have to really take the walls down a little further and make them wide. We've got to go all the way down to the bottom because if you're going up, the wall was around eight inches. We need to make it 12. So they've got to excavate around the whole thing down to the bottom footings and go up. Okay. So you've got the 12 inches. They were hoping to just raise it, but it's not weren't able to do that. No, that's okay. We need to make it uh, thicker. So just yeah. to clarify all that. Okay. Um, so we'll, we can do that change order, sign that change order, okay. um, sewer abatements, um, Trevor, did you have a chance to look at, um, yes, for seven? I did. um, so I looked at a couple of these, um, I, as I looked at last time, we looked at the main street property for Robert Decker. I did not, you know, again, we can't do a rebate. The costs look pretty similar to what we what we had, but it was a little high. We just need a, um, we would need a plumber's receipt that they fixed the, uh, fix the toilet and the, the leaking sink. Um, so we'd, we'd have something to base it on because anybody could just kind of go, hey, we had a leaking Leaks. toilet, reduce it. We just need to know that there was a repair done on the property and have a receipt for that. Um, and then we could try to calculate out the differences. It is okay, higher was... than the other years. Um, that's not on a, one. A that's one ninety eight North Main. Yes. Right? Okay. So we just need to reach out to him and see if he's got a. Um, a and then do you for the look work. at seven Elm Street? I did. So this is really tricky. So I looked at this. Um, they have had um, a toilet leak as well. However, um, I went back and looked at. Let me just find this here. Bear with me. This one. I went and did some research on this one. So here we go. Hold this up. So I went back to the, their usage was like one hundred and sixty three thousand gallons, roughly, um, and which seemed odd. The the bill before that was 94 and then there were some odd small ones um they had replaced a um a water meter so there were some estimated charges in there you can't really look back so if you look at this it looks way out of line but if you actually go back um you know their usage is 112 138 136 you know they're all in summer 200,000 if you go back over the years i went back to 2000 and 
1997. And their usage was 234,000. I looked at all of their average usage since 1997 is 152,000 gallons a year. So that's actually less. So, it, yeah. So I think um, I, I looked at that. There's an average of 8 million gallons, 8,200,000 gallons over that, that time period. There's, um, you know, 54 um, billing periods there. Um, and then, so the average is around 152,000 gallons, just on just under 153,000 gallons. Um, there did, but then I pulled the I pulled the usage by hour, uh, by days, and so it tells me, um, you know, kind of how much they use in a day, maybe um, uh, 29,000 gallons. Uh, but there's a lot of time, like in the middle of the night, where there's 20 and 30 gallons going through an hour, which kind of seems like that's a leak, because I did get a chart, like how much a toilet leaks. Um, I'm getting a little deep in the weeds here, but I just thought it would be an interesting... The pipes. No, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> deep in the pipes here. So if you have a small little leak, like a pin-sized leak, uh, you lose about 120 gallons a day. So at, at a month, you lose 3,600 gallons. Um, but if you have a decent, you know, a decent sized leak, you can lose um, 3,000 gallons a day. I mean, uh, up to a big leak, right. you 14,000 gallons a day. So you can lose quite a few. And if you look at the hourly um, losses that, you know, they could have a, a leak. However, they have several hours of no leak, no leak. So something might be running and, and using this kind of water, because there's a lot of times where there's nothing used at night. Hmm. So there's something in that facility that is using water, you know, 100 gallons an hour um, between 2 a.m. and 3 a.m. So that's a lot of water being used in the middle yeah, of the night. It is. So there's something kind of going on there, but there's a lot of hours that, that nothing is going through the system. Are, are, are most of the times when they're using water at night, are they like early? in the early to late morning it's uh it's late night uh up until um you know there may be an apartment above and people are coming home and taking a shower that kind of thing mm -hmm. um, I'm, not, I'm not really sure how the building is set up right. i know they're a cleaner you know right. and they do laundry and stuff like that so a lot of it is overnight like 80 60 gallons and then um a lot of when the water is not being used it's also that same time period you know overnight yeah i was just wondering if like they're 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 running the the cleaning cycle and then they get up in the morning and they take it out and put it in the dryer it, exactly yeah. it could so. be something like that because there's also like 9 a.m on on this sunday 9 a.m to to monday there's no use at all mm -hmm. and then a couple of spotty uses here and there and then i got charts of of the last billing period you know um what the what the flow of water is in you know and so these are times when you know sunday they're not working tuesday they're working sunday they're not working you know they're, they're off certain mm -hmm. days and there's no use the days they're there obviously there's a spike and it's all pretty consistent so the water usage even over a, a whole billing period is fairly consistent there's a few highs but there's these oddball things at night and i think if they had a leaking toilet they did mention that so i think that there is um uh, an ability to um, to help with that a bit. It's not way out of line though, as far as usage going. These are, you know, it's not like it's so running you constantly. I was recommend. I mean, this is, um, it, and we may want to look at this a little bit more before we move forward. But if I just looked at the average over those last years, um, the rebate is like two hundred and two dollars. It's not a huge amount of money, but I, I took those averages. You know, um, divided by a thousand, got our rate. Our, our billing rate is eighteen eighty four, so their bill should be two thousand eight seventy seven fifty two plus a hundred dollars fee, like everyone has. And then I deducted that amount, the um, two thousand nine seventy seven fifty two from the what they got billed, um, which is two hundred two hundred five. So even if they have a leaking toilet, we still processed all that water. You know, it's not like it leaked into the ground somewhere. So there's not a huge amount of money to go, oh, there's a major problem here. I think consistently, you know, in these low years, probably during COVID, not as much business. So I just don't see an area where there's a serious problem leakage wise that would constitute a large rebate. These bills are much larger than they used to back then because we're paying for a huge sewer upgrade. 
So that's, you know, that's a different rate than they would have been paying in 1997 or whatever. Right. So it could be just a shock at that. But if you look at the usage, it's back to what it was normally. So, yeah, when you got that um, many years of data, when did it, like, um, in the period of 05, 01, 2021, it was 68, almost 69,000. When did it, when did it, when was it previous to that? When was it near the 150, 160? Uh, so 2019, 18, you know, it was in the, yeah. it was the um, 138,000, 130,000, 140. It, it, it was yeah. pretty consistent to there. There's some oddball yeah. billing cycles for probably a, you know, an estimated charge or something. But back in 2013, 12, it was up around 200,000 yeah. usage. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's over the last few years, it's more in the 130 range. Right. Uh, 130 to 140 range. So like I said, there could be a, a rebate of, of a little bit here for for a toilet that they did say had a, had a failure. So we yeah. need that receipt so that they yeah. know it's repaired. Um, um, I thank you very much for all the research you did. Sure. That was a tremendous amount of research. Um, I am fine with that recommendation. Um, but again, both of them have to come with some kind of receipt. Just some sort of receipt, and then yeah. we can do that. So let's like pull yeah. down those until we have yeah. the receipts. And, and, and the Decker one, I mean, I just did a quick calculation. And, and if you take the three high, the, the three billing periods that are all in the same thing and average them together, it comes out to almost 57,000. Yeah. So, um, you know, we're talking about. $10, a ten thousand dollar, a ten thousand range, right? Difference, yep. Um, which could be accounted for any number of ways by, you know, renters using a lot of water. So if he yep. does have bills that show that they fix some plumbing, right? That yeah. would help. That yeah. would help. Okay. So um, next item on the agenda is setting the date for the townwide tag sale, October seventh. Is that going to work for everybody? I, sure. I can't imagine having a problem with that. No, I think that's fine. October 7th? Yeah. Yeah, that's that first Saturday. Yeah. Um, can you just make sure Pat knows? Uh, we will do that. Thank we, you. We do not. Uh, we like people to take out the permit still. Yeah. But, but there is no charge. charge. No charge, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, next item on the agenda is the formation of the Ad Hoc Pollinator Committee. Um, I'm recommending that we put this on hold for the moment because... We need to coordinate with the conservation district grants. Um, we're waiting for the FERC hog watershed um, plan for the Bloody Brook that we will take to the com um, Conservation Commission and work with them to work with the town highway department um, for you know taking vases along. There's a training that the conservation district is going to pay for to the for the highway department on how to remove invasives and how to plant pollinator uh, buffer that will absorb water and prevent, um, uh, you know, uh, prevent not really. It, it's not going to prevent flooding, but it will reduce or mitigate flooding. And also, you know, we're having a geotherm, uh, fluvio geothermologists come, field geology come and, and look at the Bloody Brook and, you know, and that will help with the buffer, establishing the buffer. And we can't do that until we have the watershed plan that starts the Conservation Commission permit. So um, I just want to hold off on this. Okay. That's okay. Sounds good. I so just love what are another we chance for you to say hydrofluvial. Yeah. Hydro uh, what are we holding off on? <laughs> the pollinator committee. Fluvio geomorphologist. Fluvio I said it correctly. All right. Is okay. That, that full, what's full circle technologies? Um, that's oh, that's else? the next thing. All right. Yes, Perfect. review and approval of the contract with full circle technolo technology for permit eyes 2020 E permitting software solution. That's the inspection software. Um, council developed a contract, standard contract that we will attach their proposal to. And if the board approves, I can sign it as soon as you say go. Um, okay, did anyone have any questions on that? Nope. We've already... I just didn't see chart eight or whatever it was, the fees, but I think I've seen them before. And I think if you're good with them, I'm good with them. I am. Okay. 
I know everybody's I got a ton of work on them. So. Yeah, and I think that's what we voted to yep, support. It is. So, we, okay. did. we did. So, yeah. Okay. Make a motion to approve the full circle technologies uh, contract. I will second it. Okay, great. Is there any further discussion? Nope. Uh, hearing none, all those in favor? Tim Helchi, aye. Trevor McDaniel, aye. Carolyn S. I. Okay, next item on the, is there any updates on the Leary lot, Chris, other than that the next meeting is 6 p.m. Um, here at the town hall on the 21st of August? Yes, um, again, that is August 21st, 6 p.m. Uh, we hope as many people are able to join as possible. Um, and other than what we discussed earlier, and again, thank you for uh, granting the town administrator authorization to sign that agreement with Rivermore to continue working with them. They've been absolutely essential to the progress we've made so far, and I look forward to continuing our work with them. Um, and at the moment, there is not much else in terms of updates. I did have a meeting with an abutter last week that I think I briefly touched base on during the special meeting. Um, and Jeff and I are looking to have a couple of more meetings with neighboring business owners, notably Hamshaw and Berkshire Brewing, regarding how our plans for the Leary Lot property are going to mesh with their plans for development on their respective properties in the near future. So um, just making sure that we're keeping good relationships, being good neighbors, and keeping the land use on each property harmonious with each other. Um, I think that there is a lot of optimism and we're in a good spot with it. Good. I'm hey. still waiting for Chief Machorek to get back with me on the uh, question of entering from North Main Street, but not exiting onto North Main Street, and whether we have an entrance and exit on Elm Street. So um, if you want to reach out to him too, Chris, before he sure. leaves. And I had a couple of other questions for him too regarding traffic safety and our different options considering it. So yeah, that's definitely a conversation I want to have. He's oh, on vacation yeah. next week, so it'd be a good idea to do it the next two days. All right. I will put him first on my list in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, he's I think he's driving to Boston maybe Thursday night, but I'm not 100% sure about that. So you get one day, really. Um, Clock is ticking. You can always <laughs> bug at him. Uh, okay, uh, next item on the agenda is uh, Janice James, George McCauley, and Kate Wallace appointments to the Human Rights Advisory Committee but yeah. also the setting of the membership of the committee. So how many people do you want on that committee? Which one well, is this, the human rights? Yes. I thought we had, uh, we had discussed the numbers of five and these are four people, right? Three. Yeah. Oh, there's three. Yep. Okay, so they those three people got back. If you set the committee at five, you have, with three people appointed, you have a quorum. Yep. And okay. And you have work you want them to do immediately. Mm -hmm. um, so we still have vacancy of two people. Two, two people. people. All right. So I will um, make that uh, motion for Janice James, George McCauley, and um, Kate Lawless. Second. Is there no, uh, no discussion? Okay. All those in favor? Tim Hilchi, aye. Trevor McDaniel, aye. Carolyn Ness, aye. Um, Can I ask one question? Is that going to be a one year term as well? One year term to probably till June of June thirtieth. Okay, because that's I just want to make sure because Pat's going to ask tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah and then yeah, we're going to have to stagger it after that. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. I think we need I to so. just get them started, and yeah. we'll worry about how to do it. So, full committee. Yeah, and uh, just sorry to interrupt, just so everybody knows, there is a fourth person that finally uh, confirmed interest today. So. I wasn't able to get her name on the agenda for this time, um, but at the board's next meeting, we could put her up for appointment as well. Okay. Well, Good. We, we can't just do it now. We could. Yeah. Who, who's if it? that's okay with you guys, it's a, it's a level of comfort thing. It's um, Gabby Richard Harrington, uh, who also serves on the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, yep. She was one of the people who had indicated interest during the survey that was put out at town meeting. Um, and yep. I heard from her today that she's still interested. Nominate her. Yeah. You said again, her name was Gabby. Harrington. Gabby Richard Harrington. Gabby Richard Harrington. So I make a motion to appoint Gabby Richard Harrington to the. Um, 
Human Rights Advisory Thank Committee. Human Rights Advisory Committee. I'll second it. <laughs> All those in favor? Tim Hilchey, aye. Trevor McDaniel, aye. Carolyn Ness, aye. Okay, Speaking so. appointments, I just wanted to say that I've had uh, uh, initial conversations with two people for the um, Deerfield Elementary School Committee. Uh, oh, good. Vacancy and just trying to work out. Um, are they interested? If they're interested, please send in a letter. How many send in a letter to Casey? And then we could get it on the agenda yeah. at some point uh, before okay. September. So, you know, they'd love to be, you know, seated and sworn in before they have their meetings. So um, just waiting to hear the level of interest and, and send in a letter to Casey. Okay. Fabulous. Um, next item on the agenda is mail. Chris, don't we have another appointment question? So there was one appointment question that um, was put on the agenda, appointments to the South County EMS Board of Oversight. It was brought to our attention that I don't believe that was ever finalized in June. Um, and I'm not sure if that's something the board wanted to address tonight or if we wanted to. Um, nope. Okay. Um, mail? There were several things in mail. Um, what are this? Uh, Chris, when you put this together, did you put them? You put the mail together. Uh, there, was there anything that there? we needed to really look at, though? There's a nice letter. Um, I would say one of the most consequential mail items was the last thing that was put in the packet, and unfortunately, it wasn't put on the mail list just because it was received yesterday. Um, yeah. But it was the letter from Senator Elizabeth Warren uh, yeah. detailing some newly available federal grant opportunities to lower energy bills for consumers through investing in distributed renewable energy. Um, that's something that I, I think is definitely um, it came consequential. In. Yeah, I wonder how that ties in with the municipal, you know, aggregation. Is that something different than? I don't know that yeah. it ties in with municipal aggregation. Yeah. Um, that's that's the issue is right because since we're already money. in that contract i don't know right. if there's something you can you know we could take advantage of or not we'll have to read it and see what it says and we may have to call dynagy and ask that right. question Trevor. exactly see, and that might I'm be sure something they'd be they're working on ready or yeah, yeah that might be a better yep spent time right um uh, chris you had a few things to say and casey you had a few things to do uh, before we get, before we get off this letter basically it says that um the notice of interest has to be in by August fourteenth, uh, oh. and it's really tight. And then the the final the final applications have to be in in September. So I don't know when this was passed, but it's uh, you know late in the game to be getting this notification, even though it's interesting. So, we may not be able to take advantage. Yeah, of it. it's, it's just a, a tight timeline. August that. twenty. Let's see. Deadline for notice of intent to apply is Monday, August twenty eighth, and um, you know, it's a Monday, August fourteen for municipalities, and um, then final applications are due September twenty sixth. So, yeah, I mean, so it's really it it allows people to well the. The IRA Act um, allows, you know, homeowners to get tax claim tax credits of up to thirty percent for residential installation of solar. Um, I don't know what else you know, there is here, though. IRA money for solar again, and that's yeah. why we just got to be in a position to take advantage of that to be able to jump. We, we need to say, we're going to put some on the church, the 1821 building. We're going to put it on the schools. I mean, we could just send in a letter saying that we're, you know, trying to go green and we want solar panels on our schools. And I just don't know how much capacity we have to write that letter in two days and still. Well, yeah, it's the 14th, so. Uh, the 14th is Monday. Yeah, I know. But so, the, but a letter of intent is just yeah. Do we have a do we have a letter of intent a notice of intent to apply letter for anything else? A standard one, not usually. Yeah, I mean, no. But I mean, have, do you know a a letter that we've written for? Uh, community one stock. We had a notice of okay. intent. Okay, so um, if you could, if if you or Chris could send me a, an example letter, I'll go looking to see if there's a specific letter that they're looking for. And I'll see if I can draw something up that is very vague and non-specific and 
Thank you, Chair. You can get it in I for just, August 14th. A notice of intent to apply. Yeah. I got it. Yeah, and it sounds like that's all that might be needed for a notice of intent. Um, so yeah, I can help with that search. And since we're we, since we've got a lot of interest in our planner grant writer, um, economic developer, um, hope maybe maybe between now and now and then we'll hire somebody and their first order of business will be the yeah. submission of the actual September twenty sixth. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, who know? I mean, that possibly that could be so first one. I just we have to use every opportunity to bring some cash in to do stuff we just yeah we may I'm, we may not be able to do it grateful, physically but. right exactly i'm grateful because that we got we really have to be concerned with our staff's time or burnout yeah, <laughs> yeah well that's why we, we also that's have why to you burn out the new hire yeah right yeah we're talking about a new hire yeah how far out can they be even have been onboarded by the time this is done. yeah no that's fine okay, okay. Um, we'll, we'll find a balance between uh making sure we have them hit the ground running and not scaring them out the door yeah, sounds good. That's very thing, good. Yeah. This is this is the interview question. Write yeah. the letter of intent. Yeah. Write the application. You get the grant, you get the job. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Uh so Chris, do you want to start with your report? Sure. Uh so a couple of points I touched on in my ATA report this week. Um, we're still working with Entree to resolve some of those email issues that have been pestering our staff for a couple of months now. Um, since before we even onboarded with Entree, we've been having some inconsistent issues where certain emails sent to accounts at Yahoo, at AOL, at Verizon, and possibly some others have been bouncing back um, undeliverable. It's kept us from being in touch with different committee members who use personal emails. It's kept us from being in touch with uh, certain outside vendors that we normally need to. It's really been disruptive to our operations and uh, our wonderful administrative assistant, Pat Kroll, has been on the phone for more hours than I could probably count on both of my hands in just the past week um, trying to get this resolved. And it's it's been an issue, but we're trying to get to the bottom of it. And I can't thank Pat enough. Uh, uh, I hate to be a pain, Chris, but don't forget my email. I can't. I can't access my official email all the time. Yes, once Let, in a while I can, but not always. Sure, I will uh, follow I mean, up that, on that one and that, see. That the issue um, has been true for two emails of mine. I have two separate town emails, and both of them are have access issues. Okay, I will make a note of that and make sure that. They, and then we need to um, eliminate one of them. I mean, we need to make sure there's only one out there, not two. Sure. Oh, the, the, I had the new email. I mean, the reason why I got a second email was to try to, to so I could access it and it was the same issues. Hmm. No, that's a, that's a really good point. And I'll, I'll make sure that gets brought to Andre's attention. Um, so the next issue, the uh, fleet schedule, I've been working on the annual process of making sure our fleet schedule is up to date. Um, it's due later this month and it's for insurance purposes. Um, luckily, we aren't a huge community, so we don't have that many vehicles to keep track of, but there are still a decent number of changes that can happen in a given year and making sure that all of those are accounted for is something that does take a little bit of time. So I've been working with the different department heads on that. Uh, so Leary Lot discussions with neighbors, I already touched on that a little bit, but last week I, I had a meeting with an abutting property owner. Um, some of the key concerns that she had that she was very pleased um, with the direction that the previous meeting uh, took in terms of focusing a lot on green space. Uh, and another point she was concerned about is just really making sure that we're installing some type of barrier for privacy between the abutting residential units and the Leary lot itself. Um, and I think that's very feasible um, and it's a reasonable concern. And then also some thoughts that she had on uh, safety for both the pedestrians and the vehicle traffic um, were definitely noted and will be talked about with both Jeff and Chief Pachurik. Uh Jeff Squire from Berkshire Design and myself are gonna be looking at a time frame for next week, hopefully to sit down with those two neighboring business owners I mentioned earlier. Uh, one of them is away this week, but we are hoping to kind of have that meeting to sit down and make sure we're all on the same page. So you will be ready for the 21st, Chris? Yes. Yep. We're very much looking forward to the 21st, and we should definitely be ready. Um, Universal Electric, uh, as you know, they're the contractor we're working with for the installation of the EV charging infrastructure. Um, 
I've been working with our council to bring their quotes onto our standard contract form, which isn't a huge lift, but it's just something that has taken a little bit of time. So we are looking to make sure that happens pretty much immediately. And I hope to have that on the board's next agenda. Um, and then personnel and vacancies, we've gotten a bunch of applications for the planning and economic development coordinator and a decent number of them, I would say, are very attractive candidates. So um, we're looking to narrow our candidate pool and begin making some interview selections by next week. Uh, the position has been advertised on the town website, on Indeed, on the MMA jobs page, and in the Mass Planners email listserv. Uh, and I think all of those have been really helpful in getting it to as diverse a candidate pool as possible. Uh, in terms of the SCEMS chief, that position was put on the website this week, as well as Indeed, uh, and uh, Interim Chief Drumgool was able to send me the info on two specific job forums that are uh, specifically targeted at EMTs, uh, and either one or both of them are national pages, so we could be reaching a huge pool of potential people. Um, and according to what he said, uh, director positions usually are very, very popular on that page, so hopefully that's a lot of promise for us. Um, the town clerk position. So personnel board is meeting next Monday. There is going to be a discussion about the town clerk position, and there's going to be more to come on that at the next meeting. Um, yep. Finally, the last point I have for you all, um, the Sugarloaf Condominiums Street Acceptance. The planning board officially voted to move the acceptance of Snowberry Circle and Greylock Lane forward. Uh, so that is going to move to a public hearing. Uh, and if it works with all of you, uh, September 6th is the day that Casey and I were thinking of for that public hearing. Um, that would give us uh, until next late next week, early the week after that, to get it advertised and um, oh yeah, no, give us plenty of time before town meeting in October. So that would be a layout hearing for those okay. areas. So. And we did. I did send an email out. I had a question about um, something I haven't dealt with before related to this. So I sent a question to Lisa about that, and we'll be following up with her. Okay. Um, so uh, you are on next for your I update. Am next, yes. So um, the board took their vote for emergency spending. It took a couple of days to get DLS's gateway to let me talk to them, um, but I filed the emergency spending vote today and received almost an immediate approval. Okay, so we're good to go with that particular thing. Um, I did want to note for everyone that the emergency itself has really impacted a lot of the projects and regular work around here. And you've seen it from, you know, the emergency management team's perspective, but it's happening with the rest of the staff. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to help us keep up with things. And we've had some financial conversations and, and other types of interactions just so we, for planning purposes, as we're getting closer toward special town meeting, mm -hmm. dealing with the closure of the fiscal year. We're trying to be aware of impact, financial impacts, because we also have that USDA loan that's coming up. Yes. The second loan, which was scheduled to be closed in mid to late September. Now it's looking more like it needs to be late September. But we've had some conversations, certainly Brenda and Trevor, myself and Sarah have sat down and talked about that with Kevin, um, because it's a timing issue. So mm -hmm. that's something that's out there. But the good news is, um, and kudos and hand clapping for uh, Brenda, our town accountant, she is almost ready to send free cash out for approval. She's right. closing the books and is hoping to have it done um, definitely before she leaves on vacation, but hopefully Perfect. as soon as possible. Yes, so that's great. That's good for us because A, we need the audit to start and B, it gets us much closer to what our planning needs are for the special town meeting. Right. In case there are funding issues we need to deal with. Yep. So um I I would like you to send an email to Joe Comerford and Nally Blay saying that we had met tonight with the select board for with Conway to try to you know, help them and and talk about our roads in common, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And that their asks for three nine three million nine uh hundred thousand and ours for uh four million seven seven hundred thousand. 
we'd really appreciate as soon as possible. Some movement on that? Yeah, yeah. Okay. just just to like a little update. Like okay. we're, we're breathing down your neck kind of thing. Well, I think they expected that to come, but yeah. Well, just use the excuse of meeting tonight to put it out there. Yeah, especially after this meeting. Yep. Okay, so you want me to send them an email that says basically, you know, we're looking at yep. upwards of $10 million just for in two towns. Eight we million like six to for the two eight, towns. Eight, eight, six, and can they group it in with the a bill that they're looking at in the Berkshire series sure. all together. Yeah. yeah. I don't even know what the damage assessments were for out there. Right. Yeah. I think North Adams had some stuff. Yeah, North Adams. I mean, there's there's a lot of stuff out here. Hmm. But we, the two two communities, know we have 8.6 million. Yeah. Okay. And we're looking for help as soon as yeah. as we, much help as soon as possible. We're bleeding cash. Yeah. And we would really like to have cash back. Yep. Yeah. Um as soon as possible i it's not that i don't think that they're going to get us cash but they need to know that it needs to come as soon as possible because we have okay. cash flow issues yeah, and I mean, we also need the to volume be for winter uh, right yeah but, right well i heard that come out more than once exactly. during that conversation yeah well and we, pine nook is an issue particularly since school starts relatively soon yeah mm -hmm. but it's what is really truly is the magnitude of these losses is meaning that we're having cash flow problems. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that would be very nice if they could speed it up. I, can I hit one thing real sure. quick? Sure. Um, just, well, just maybe Casey may have this already, but I just wanted to, for the residents that um, they may see an Eversource helicopter flying overhead. Yes. I got your email on that. that. Yep. Um, and that's because every once in a while they'll go and inspect the line. So if you see a helicopter kind of flying low, uh, they're inspecting the um, the power lines going through and the dates. I think uh, the flights will begin around August 16th and continue through August 18th. Um, the schedule is weather dependent, and if they have planned rates, uh, planned rain dates of um, the 21st and 22nd. So. You know, they'll be going all over Western Mass, but just if you see them in our town, that's kind of what they're doing. It's really annoying. Yep, a blue and white helicopter. Uh, so you'll see that. Flight times are 8 a.m. to 4 p.m., weather permitting. Um, the, uh, one other quick thing, I, again, you may have this, but I just really want to congratulate Jennifer Remillard, who have been working on a um, digital literacy grant which she received a hundred thousand dollars hundred thousand dollars so she'll be able to provide um ipads for the seniors and do some training on um ipad use and just keeping our seniors connected with their families and learning how to use the internet and all that stuff and just becoming more more familiar with all of that stuff and making sure that they have access to to people and the outside world and all yes. that yes we executed that, that contract as soon as we could yeah. That triggers the one thing that I forgot to tell people. We are not having the senior flu clinic on uh, September 15th. I'm trying to get it for the 13th of September, um, which is a Wednesday, or the 22nd, which is the following Friday. The, the reason why we're not having it the 15th is because Trevor alerted me that People, all the seniors were packing up and going to the Big E that day. E, yeah. So we can't get your shots that day. So um, we're trying to, I just don't have confirmation, although I requested those two dates. So as soon as I know, I will let people know. So it's either the 13th or what's the other day? 13th, 13th or the 22nd. 22nd. The Thank 13th you. was my first choice, 22nd is my second choice. So you couldn't do a shot in the bus? I know, we should have done that. Like a shot in a beer? <laughs> shot, beer shot in the bus. Know. Maybe a shot in a bus and a beer. I think oh, funnel cake has got to be the first priority. <laughs> they want to have some uh, stamina when they're walking around um, there, apparently. So. I just want to make sure that the August letter, no. 21st uh, meeting with for the Leary lot is um, posted as a select board meeting. And that um, the August 17th, which is an unusual date, is Thursday, is a SCEMS oversight board meeting. Okay. And yep. that needs Tim to be... confirmed that this morning yeah. with us. Okay. I just want to make sure. Is there any other thing that we did? You have some more cases. Yeah. I did have a couple. Oh, I'm okay. sorry. Yep. Sorry. I didn't mean to cut you. you off. No, Trevor. Did. Yeah, I, I cut her <laughs> off. Sorry. Um. So FCAT is still trying to consolidate their space, and they're working with me. We found a procurement flaw that I had to notify Jonathan about, and it's really my fault. Um. But he and I are discussing that. Um. 
because essentially what we need to do is streamline what we're what their our access points are so it's easier to broadcast for them and they can consolidate their studio potentially in Sunderland. Um, so that's been part of that conversation. Um, the This also led me to look at a couple of other procurements that have been outstanding. So when I made the comment earlier about the flood mitigation really taking up space in the room, it's also taking up space in terms of planning because sidewalks are gonna be impacted. The ability for us to get in sidewalks um, will be impacted <laughs> because we have such a huge response that we're still mitigating. Um, and I don't have Kevin here to, to pound me on the head about that but i know that that's one of the things he's concerned about he's also concerned about realistically the board wanted those sidewalks done um there were some changes to how the board wanted to see the sidewalks done which meant the specifications had to change they went back up to andrea right um i kevin and i were talking about them okay. going we did i did talk to andrea about it there was a question about specs in a document she and I looked at the document um and I had a question for Kevin about that so we're trying to connect with him um in terms of grants I wanted to make a comment and a note that DPC had pursued the gap three grant right Trevor yes and then Signed we up. finalized the documentation we needed for both the stormwater and asset management grants that they were going to submit on our behalf um, to state revolving fund yep. yesterday. Yep. So that information went to them. And we um, also signed, right. I don't, we, the, the gap three one was about the uh, saving energy with the, the, air, yeah, with the aerator. aeration system. So we got that. Stormwater is, stormwater and asset management are also SRF grants that yep. hopefully can help us build tools so that we know what our, know what we need, in, especially in terms of planning, capital planning in particular. I just want to reiterate that the town of Deerfield with two sewer plants have through all this terrible weather has had no releases. Yes. We have managed through all the rainstorms. And and what was the total volume that was put through the old Deerfield? 430,000 one day. I think it was 400 and something the other day. And yeah, three, so well three, over three, the 250,000 permitted allowance. Okay, just wanted to get that on. We the were out of permit because of the volume, but we did not release anything. Right, right. And that's a huge difference from what's happening in surrounding communities. In surrounding communities. What's happening yes. regularly in, in Montague and Greenfield. And a huge thank you to, to um, Eric Niels and his team. I mean, they do a re they were amazing. really good job. And they're trying to do all this through a massive changeover at that plant. It's really stressful. And, um, you know, because you're... These bugs are at a certain balance between oxygen, food, and when you get a big flush of water like that, and you then you're trying to change over to the new clarifier and try and get things settled, and Stop. it's very hard, very hard work. And they're doing. And there's a, great a lot job. going on in that space. Yeah. Um, so kudos to them. They've done. Yep. They've done an amazing very, job. Very proud of them. I did want to bring some bring you up to date on one of the grants that we had tried to get an extension for, and that's the shared streets and spaces grant through MDOT, mm -hmm. which would be for crosswalks on North Main Street. I'm fairly certain we will get that extension. I'm waiting for the papers, the paperwork. Once we have it, we're going to get in touch, and the grant team is going to get in touch with the COG and ask for some assistance to get an engineer that's familiar with this type of a grant and did it for another town um, so that we could finalize that. That's a good idea. Um, because we really would like to get that stuff moving. Mm -hmm. um, I did also want to alert the board to a couple concerns related to hiring the planning economic development coordinator. We're going to run into space issues in here. And for purposes of having a separate office, the only space we have is the conference room because FCAT won't be out. And we really are housing our servers in, in the FCAT space right now, along with their equipment, because all that equipment has to be. So this could, this is something that Chris and I are going to start working on because we won't have a person hired right away. However, we need that person to be to have a consistent workspace and connectivity with other town staff, but also access to our records, our printing capability, and communication capability. So 
this, this is now going to be really the more staff we have to deal with, the di more difficult it's going to be in here because we don't have any other places to put people. And this, I'm not suggesting this is a good idea. I'm just asking a question <laughs> here. Um, there does seem to be a real large room that has one person in it in the- I already thought of that. And it's also got, you know, I'm, I'm speaking about, mm -hmm. um, um, yeah, Menard's office. Assessor planning, Seth, yeah, assessor planning. Just a thought for a short term solution. That's um, a question with the assessors you all would have to discuss with yeah. them. Yeah. Frankly, we can recalibrate in the two areas that are currently used for select board work. Yeah. We could probably recalibrate on that, but other people are going to have to move and we still may not have space because we don't have space down in inspections. Yeah. It's already too crowded down there. Yeah. Um, given my druthers, I would move at least one person out. So I want you to understand that we will try to solve this, but it's up. Yeah, in it may have to be the conference room. Um, or, or, yeah, and this is not a good idea either on a regular basis, but maybe there's a, maybe we're partitioning off a section of this room, mm. you know, with, you know, open plan. The issue is, is we don't have a lot of power to this room. Yeah. That's well, part of the issue. Yeah. I thought about that. Yeah. yeah. But we also use this space for voting. Oh, I know, but we do that once a year. Well, you know, and, a couple times a year. You know, so hopefully we're going to have a new office and uh, we'll and then worry about it over there. Um, I did see a letter, right, from yeah. McGovern, or was it McGovern? Uh, Markey. 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 Yeah. Yeah. That's right, to McGovern. Yeah. And Elizabeth and Warren Elizabeth actually Warren called Tim called and said, you're in the budget. That's wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. That was great news. It says if the house... Amazing. Yeah, but if they, the house doesn't blow up, the budget process <laughs> will be fine. Don't hold your breath. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I'm do done. Anything at okay. The I do have one question. The Comcast thing. What is this twenty four thousand five hundred dollars? That's the they give us money every month for they collect from um, every subscriber, and um, that's for FCAP. and that comes for our. Public television. So channels. that's the pe those are the peg access funds that yeah. you hear about during the right. budget process. Right. Yeah. yeah. But we get twenty four thousand every month. No. 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 Every that's why month. yearly. Yearly. That's why I was asking. So this is yeah. the yearly payment from the monthly thing. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And I don't understand that be can go away magically to... in the next two years. Mm -hmm. um, there is one. Oh, I'm sorry, Carolyn. There's one other thing I need to bring up that relates to FCAP. Um. We we currently don't have an active agreement with FCAT. Turns out Sunderland doesn't either. So we need to revisit that. So I'm going to talk to Jonathan about that. We also have a surplus of funds for um, hard capital. capital. And I just want to make sure that before Jonathan leaves this building, that we get the building sorted out. So we actually had that conversation. We okay. had been trying to get in touch with a vendor that actually Waitley used to recalibrate in here. And one of the conversations that Jonathan and I had actually with Jeff Kravitz over in Sunderland was how do we make this an easy broadcast situation? What Waitley did was they made changes in their room so that it's basically press a button. And the issue, a lot of the issues for us are hearing, people being able to hear. So we had a quote that said, we can fix some of this for you, certainly by dropping there i can show it to you if you want to see it but that's a re re i actually threatened to walk in wasman's office well we day. have yeah but we have money we, we do have money what we have to we do is get a quote and that's what we had asked for several times wasman has been extremely busy they work i they're on one of the state contracts but they work a lot with umass well don't shake your head Trevor. no i was just thinking about putting a drop ceiling in here they actually had a different solution that wasn't a drop ceiling, but would capture sound coming from yeah. the spaces that really voices are working on. Yeah. And that's what I wanted to revisit with them. And so that's Chris and I talked about that. That would be, here. yeah, but they that would be plan. great. We need, we, well, we also need to clean this up because it's not OSHA compliant and <gasps> our OSHA compliance officer gets on my, um, my back. He can that bring another rug. I'm fine with that. I like the rug. <laughs> She don't like the cords under the rug. So that is part of the conversation yeah. that John uh, had add to the floor. Yeah. But then you got to step into these offices is the issue. Yeah. 
Yeah, we, need and we can't really building. eliminate that we that need meeting space. I know. Yeah. I just I'm just want us to before FCAT moves out, get this fixed. Okay. So it is push button for us. It would be the way that we would envision it is it's how we set up these types of um, boards and the speaker compilation and stuff. They had designed something that they thought would work better in this space because this space is so big. We lose so much sound up right. know, into the ceiling. We need something that works so that poor Trevor doesn't have to run down here every time somebody is doing something. Pretty simple right now, but it's not for everybody. So that's, It's also yeah. hard to hear online. I hear that. And, yeah. Is and, that depending on the camera up there or are you hearing us fine, Chris? I hear you fine. Um, my understanding is there's an issue with the sound system that apparently if a cord gets jiggled just a little bit, it completely messes with the audio. And I got a couple of reports that the planning board meeting this past Monday night was almost inaudible. Because really? Of that. So, right. Yeah. I wonder what yeah. that is. It, well, sometimes it's because it goes through the camera that's on the top yeah. of the TV and not yeah, that's exactly the right what line. happens. Right. Yeah, that's the key. Yeah. Okay. Well. Mm -hmm. So no, yeah, we, we haven't have forgotten, forgotten Carolyn. Yes, we will try to fix it. That's a lot of yep. a lot of work on your part. Okay. Okay. Um, I think we're ready for an adjournment. Motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor. Tim Hilchi, aye. Trevor McDaniel, aye. Hi, Carolyn S. I. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Have a good Bye. night. Thank you, Casey.